A New York City landmark could be the victim of the real estate boom. CBGB is considered the birthplace of punk rock, and it could be evicted at the end of the month. No generation. You look at the neighborhood around CBGBs, everything has changed. It was obvious somebody was sitting on his real estate until it was worth money and pulled. They just fixed this place up and turned into nice apartments. We're not arguing that they shouldn't get more rent, but this is, they, this is putting me out. We play so loud that all the amps couldn't take it, but now we got these amps that they they can they really they they work. You know, we can really push them, and we could blow this place apart if we wanted to. At the very beginning of CBGs, whatever took place there influenced everything. Everyone played two sets, so you'd go and you'd be, have your mind blown, and then you'd stay, and then you have your mind blown again. It was kind of like high school situation where, you know, you had, it wasn't like adults, you know, I mean, you didn't go over and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and it was like, you know, the other kids are there and you're doing their thing. You know, if you, if you wanted to play Madison Square Garden, then you had to start somewhere in New York. You know? I mean, everything went on. I mean, everything. From sex, you know, to preparing set lists. The name of this song is Psycho Killer. It was like a little, it was like a kind of clubhouse for the people who got it. It's a fascinating place, I must say. It's probably one of the most interesting places in New York. Psycho Killer, Kiss You don't think the atmosphere when it's crowded here and loud is conducive to violence? No, I think the, you know, the more crowded and the louder it is, I think the less violence. You know, there's a zillion clubs, but it was the first one. Important stuff really did happen. Hello, it's me. I've thought about us for a long, long time. Maybe I should. <laughs> Guess what? It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Once again, clank your chains and count your change. Come to get down. Jump around. That's what's up. You know who does that song? Anybody? Hello, it's me. Anybody? He also did. When I saw the light in your eyes. Anybody? Come on. There you go. Pat Baldwin got it. That's right. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Yes, right. Todd Rundgren. Todd is God. Yep. Todd Rundgren. Girls in my junior high school loved Todd Rundgren. And as a young teenager, I hated Todd Rundgren. I hated what he looked like. I hated the fact that all the other, all the cute girls in my junior high school loved him. I hated him. <laughs> you know? So what's happening, everybody? Good to see. Good to see everybody. Everybody stacking up. I'm glad to see you. Happy to see you, and I hope you're happy to see me. Um, you know, is that right? Todd Rundgren does he have a diner in Vermont? I don't know about that. Todd Rundgren has. I'd go to Todd Rundgren's diner. Yo, Todd. Yo, Todd, yo, Todd Rundgren produced a lot of great records too, as we all know. New York Dolls and, you know. Drew Stone, what's up from Connecticut, son? Keeping it real. For, all right, good. Glad somebody's keeping it real in Connecticut, right? Hey, 
Frankie too far. What's happening? All right, the gang's all here. Let's 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 get down to brass tacks, so to speak. He lives in Hawaii. Yeah, speaking of Connecticut, he lives in Hawaii. Listen, it's not true. Todd Rundgren does not have a diner in Vermont. He's fucking sitting on his ass in Hawaii, up on some Hawaii money. Produced the New York. Yo, Todd Rundgren produced a lot of stuff. You know what? We got to get Todd Rundgren on this show, right? Bro, bro, we got to get Todd Rundgren on the show. He produced Bad Religion too. That's right. He did a lot. Yo, Todd Rundgren did a lot of stuff. I bet he's cool too. And Utopia is some great shit too. All the girls in my junior high school loved that dude. And I was like, yo, fuck that dude. Well, hello, it's me. It was huge. Fuck, hello, it's me. <laughs> Fuck, I saw the light. and Fuck, I want to bang a drum and all that shit. I can appreciate him now. I can appreciate, you know, I can appreciate him now. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> enough of that. <laughs> enough about that. Boy, boy, that, boy we can, went, out, went out a tangent right out of the gate, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, this is photo of the day. Wrong answers. Only please. And listen, don't go off the rails on this one either, because I know it could be very easy to get really fucking weird with this one. Wrong answers only, please. There you go. Is it? Is it? Good evening from Italy. I don't want to work. I just want to bang on the drums all day. Is it Slayer? Close. Mm. Is it Kiss? Close. Close. Is it Midnight Oil? Close. Dun, dun, dun. Just, don't read, just don't read the rug. <laughs> Yo, fuck that dude too. Midnight Oil. Is it Siv? Good one, Frankie. Is it Todd Rundgren? Yeah. Is it... As they say in Germany, is it Wenger? Wenger. Is it Armored Saint? Some of you, That's some of your favorite shit right there. Love Armored Saint, man. Is it Duran Duran? Her name is Rio and she dances on... <laughs> is it Meatloaf Tribute? Is it S.O.D.? Is it Satan Be Gone? Is it the Wu-Tang Clan? Great to be here. Well, great. Well, we can get started now, Daniel, now that you're here. <laughs> Travesty. Is it Leonard Skinner? Yep. Robert Granger. I know that guy. Is it Fear Factory? Is it Judas Priest? Yo, anybody hear the new Judas Priest record? Yeah, a new song came out. New song, a whole new record, a whole record I heard. Did the whole album come out? Maybe it did come out Friday. I must say. I must say, by acts or whatever, like I heard, I listened to it and I was like, damn, this sounds like Judas Priest. <laughs> yeah. Man, sounds just like Judas Priest. This shit sounds like, you know. All right, back to the task at hand. Yes. Here we go. Let's put another one up. Right answers only, please. Here we go. Right answers only, please. Boom. Is it Journey? Men Without Shoes. Don't stop believing. <laughs> Is it Pantera? Is it Pantera with the money sign? Is huh. it Pantera? Is it Pantera? Is it Incendiary Device? Is it, hell no, bro. That's definitely not Incendiary Device. Is, you don't play barefoot. Yeah, yeah, I don't play barefoot, and there's nobody like no mountain men in the band, no biker dudes. Um, That's what happens to Sean when he stops shaving. John, John says, I actually thought it was Gorilla Biscuits. All right. Is it cat? Listen. Listen, Paul Stone. All right. Yes. What do we got here? Go ahead. Yes, this is obviously Pantera. As it says right there on the rug, they're standing on the. Um, 
Pantera, um, Madison Square Garden. First time they've ever played Madison Square Garden. And obviously we know this is the the legacy lineup, which is features Charlie Benante and Zach Wilde, along with Phil and Rex. And uh, great, I mean, it was Pantera, Lamb of God, and a band called Child Bite, which is off uh, Phil's Housecore Records label. Is this and, uh, Lamb of God? Lamb of God. Lamb of God, that's a rock show right there. Look at that it stage. Looks, it looks like their stage show is way better than Pantera. You know, I got to give it to Pantera. They let Lamb of God do the full scale, like, pyro. I mean, it was almost like a double bill. It was almost like a double headliner. I mean, right, right. and Lamb of God just crushed it. I mean, right. and not only that, it, was, it turned out it was uh, Randy's 53rd birthday. And they brought him a cake out and everything. And is that um, what this picture is that you sent me? I'm like, what's going on? I mean, this is during, this is during Pantera's set. But like, what's going on here? Oh, that is during uh, when they do walk. And it looks like I could see the guys in child bite are up there. There's one guy on a mountain bike, um, singing along with Rex Brown is none other than Dave Snake Sabo from Skid Row. Oh, wow. And uh, who I originally saw Pantera open for Skid Row back in the day. Right. But th this looks like Child Bite and some friends. Who's on, who's on the, who's on, someone's on a, a BMX bike? Yeah, that guy's on a bike. And apparently he's, uh, he's some, he's from Canada. He's like a friend of the band and uh, he brings his bike all over the place. So, Volt but, BMX. And uh, you know who this guy is, John? He'll know. He's he's our BMX go-to guy. John will know. Yeah. But uh, this is during the big, you know, respect walk Re thing. So, dun, 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 but dun. uh, Spe yeah, they they um, it was. I mean, there was a couple of song choices I might have changed for Pantera, but otherwise, um, both bands were great, and it was. How long uh, did they play for? They did about an hour and a half. Lamb of God did about an hour. Yeah, man. An hour and a half of Pantera. Is, just, <laughs> yeah. is, is that too much for you? Yeah, man. Like, you know, like, like in my world, like if somebody said, listen, we're gonna, you know, I could do Pantera for a half hour. You know, the funny thing is you're a dead fan and they would play like three and a half hour shows. Dude, they did three and a half hour shows when I was a teenager and I was hammered on LSD. <laughs> so, you know, they could have done 30 hours and I wouldn't have known the difference. You know? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess it's a, you know. Oh, somebody Dude. said the guy on the bicycle was comedian Dave Hill. Is that right? Really? Okay. Ah, uh, Larry says Dave Hill on the BMX, comic. All right. Wow. All right. Yeah, it was kind of funny. Like he just kind of jumped up there on the bicycle. Okay, but uh, so yeah, Pantera now in this day and age is is um, from left to right. It's it's Rex, um, Philip, Charlie Bonante, who yep. is a great drummer. Oh, yeah. and uh, and Zach Wild. You know, it really that's what Pantera is now. You know? This is the perfect the perfect two guys to fill those slots. Really. Yeah, you know, I mean, and uh, and overall, I mean, I, I was it was very cool. I actually didn't even know I was going to be at that show until the night before. Uh, a friend of mine surprised me uh, with some tickets, and um, it was it was a blast. We, had, in fact, I I saw I I sat down, and I was wearing a sick of it all shirt, and my friend Denise is with me, and she goes points, and she goes, "This is your friend from Sick of It All." He was three seats in front of me. It was Lou. Nice sitting there, and I saw Eddie Metal there. I saw, I you know, it, it, saw it, I felt the by. stress coming from Madison Square Garden. Like, <laughs> I, I like, I talked to some people at Pantera Camp, and I could just feel the stress. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna sit this one out. Wow, it was, it was fun. You know, it was cool. Did you see it? There were some great photos floating around the, um, before the show. They were walking. Yeah, I saw those. I saw those with Ross Halpin. Yeah. Great and shot. they did like a dress to kill. They were all in suits yeah. and everything. Yeah. Which yep. is awesome. I mean, Russ Halfen, another absolute photo legend, by the way. Yeah.
um, who we got to get one of these days. Harris at Carpos. I was just watching old Stone Films NYC videos, and I saw the live button on. Let's go. Well, welcome to the show, Harris. <laughs> As fate would have it. Anyway, let's get chopping. Let's bring our guest on. Yeah, let's uh, do it. Have a good Sunday. And you uh, too. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you in a bit. Absolutely. Okay. There you have it. Hardcore Shutterbook, Stephen Messina. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Mad Vintage. And one two six hardcore clothing. They're they're a clothing brand, for, a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials, and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them and ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Let's bring our guest on. I know he's chomping at the bit. I had a bunch of laughs with him uh, in the pre-show. Looking forward to this. Here we go. Today's guest grew up in and around the iconic New York City nightclub, CBGB. He's the son of the club's proprietors, the infamous Hilly and his wife, Karen Crystal. Please welcome, coming at us from La Ciudad de Nueva York, here today to give us some perspective on the 50th anniversary of CBGB, Mr. Dana Crystal. Hey, man. I don't know. I, I, I'm not looking in the camera. What is the, I don't get this camera stuff. You're all right. You'll be okay. Take oh, my I hand. Should, should <laughs> You're good. You're good. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get used to it really quick. Be don't, don't be self-conscious. Oh. How you doing? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm I'm pretty good. All right. How are you? I'm How I'm are good. You? I'm good, and, I, and I've done a lot of homework, and I'm excited about today's show. So let's let's jump right into it, and and you and you'll 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 ease into it. You know, how did how did you come up? Did you how did you come up? Where'd you grow up? You know, was music a part of you know uh, you growing up? You know, how did you know how did you come up? Where I was born up? in a woman's hospital on on uh. uh on on uh the 170s i think it was called the women's hospital and af and the first one of the first things i remember well there's two things one thing was i wouldn't shut up and my father told me to shut up i was crying in the crib uh -huh. and then my, and then the next thing i kind of remember is my sister and i she liked me at one time and we liked each other we went to the window and we looked out the window and we were pretty high up and I don't know why we decided to drop clay on people's heads. That was really fun. That's the first thing I remember. Then we went to the farm in, in New Jersey, my you, grandparents you, farm that my father probably mentions in the book. And, and this is, this is, this is very interesting. Your father, Hilly Crystal, uh, his parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. They came here, right? Yes, my my grandfather actually has a little story that I won't go into, but basically he's he was walking and being trailed. What is it? World War One or two? I I don't remember. I think it was World War One. And he's being trailed by the enemy, and he and he decides the best thing to do is not turn around. So he went like twenty miles without turning around, and they didn't kill him. And, and mm -hmm. that was my grandfather in Russia. Yeah, I don't know what that was. I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm a little ignorant of of that kind of history. So your your dad, anyway. your, your your dad, your dad, Hilly Crystal, uh, his parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. He 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 came here. He came, he came to America, and um, and, I don't know young, about my grandmother. I I thought she was born here, but I don't know. But I know my grandfather wasn't. I'm listening. Yes, sorry. Got it. And, and did your mom? Did did Karen? And, and by the way, I I remember your mom very vividly. Um, did, did, did your mom come from a similar background? She was poor. So a lot of people that are anti-Semitic think when somebody's thrifty, they're cheap, but she was poor. That means for mm. 10 cents, she can go to the movies. So right. she grew up very poor in Boston and her mother, mother was very strict. So I think her father may have been also, 
And it, it was just very difficult. She had a hard time. My father wasn't poor. He wasn't rich, but they had a farm. They had an interesting life. My, my mother was just plain poor, which actually helped CBGBs. Because it's, she, it's, it's very interesting because my parents, um, excuse me, my grandparents came from the same area uh, in, in Russia, and they had a farm in New Jersey as well. Really? That's yeah. funny. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, so maybe we could become friends. Maybe, maybe we're Mushtuka. Maybe, maybe, maybe Mishtuka, somewhere. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, Mishtuka, yes. maybe somewhere along the line, you know, our great grandparents uh, hung out. So, so your dad, Hilly Crystal, he um, he he went to the Marines at a young age, but he was also um, he studied music, right? He 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 was well. He, had, he was he a violin. Music. He was very good at the violin. He played the violin on the farm. And and he had to work very hard on the farm. I, I heard he didn't get along with his father very much. He had to work very hard. My grandfather was very nice to me on my father's side, but I didn't meet the other one. But he had a very hard time, according to what he said. Uh, and he he played the violin. That's what the first thing he did. Yes. Yeah. And very good. He could have been in, in an orchestra for the violin. Got it. Uh, you, 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 and it's and it's kind of. I say of because most people say of, even though correct English is have. But I say of because it's, I'm it's a colloquial kind of person. Yeah, it's I'm interesting a, because when I think of your dad, right, and and we'll show some later pictures of him. But when I think of your dad, I sort of like, and you know, I didn't. Me, I could speak for myself and a lot of other people. I didn't really converse much with your dad, and and we played we played the club a lot. He would just grunt at me or or say he what grunt, He's but, famous for grunting because that's yeah. his thing, grunting. Yeah. Usually. But the last thing that I would think was that you know he was almost like a prodigy. He was like a musician, and and you know we talked about him. Um, he he uh, he had a great voice as well, huh? Uh, he had a. I think my mother was a better singer, but I think he had a better voice. I compared them right. with my mother was an actress. So I compare her with more with Bob Dylan, even though right. she had a better Bob Dylan didn't have a great voice, but he's a, one of the greatest singers of all time. And my father had a great voice, but it didn't go over. Well, well that's another story when we get to Hilly's on Ninth Street. It, yeah. And, and and your dad was in the Marines. Your, your mom was a whack, right? She was. Well, some people that didn't like her might like to call her that, but she. I think in the I think in the in the Canadian Navy, I think it was called a whack. She volunteered, and she yeah. was too young to be in the the army in the United States, so she was a whack, and she was a a, 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 a nanny, and she saved up money. That life savings went to my father opening up the business. That's the first money that went into right. the business was my mother's money. And and as we kind of get into this, we're going to see, uh, yeah. you know. To a certain extent, that uh, Karen Crystal, in a lot of ways, is sort of the unsung hero in the story of CBG. My sister and my father hid hid my mother. It's just there's no debate about it. It's I, I could there's so many different ways to explain that. Yes, they she was they tried to hide her. Yeah, he tried to hide her in every chance he could. He didn't want people to know uh, what she did. I, I, I don't. That's why. That's why. Honestly, I didn't like my father if he treated my mother different than a lot of men treat their wives, I would have liked my father. He didn't have to treat me perfectly. He treated me good enough. But yeah, that's that's my big resentment. That's yep. it. And and your parents met, this is this is this is pretty incredible. Your parents met in an acting class, right? No, no, no. I, I I met of no they met in a in a an opera class. An oh, it was excuse opera. Me. The, right. A famous opera teacher. I don't know who. I don't remember who he was. They met in a. They were both studying opera. My mother was doing it more for acting, and my father was doing it because he he was a singer. Got, got it. And uh, so, so moving it along, um, your your dad, your dad was the manager of the Village Vanguard, which was a jazz club, right? And, yes. And, and, before and, 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 that, I think it was before that. I'm a little confused. I think was it before or afterwards he sang in the in the in the Radio City Music Hall. I, I I get a it was almost the same time, but one was before the other. I'm a little confused by that. Got it. Sorry. But so so he, he was singing at Radio City Music Hall, uh give or take. 
He was the manager of the Village Vanguard. One was, and, I think, before the other, even though they probably overlapped a little. Yes. Got it. And I know he was co-founder with Ron Delsner of the Central Park Music Festival. That right? came afterwards, yes. And I, I mean, can say this, you know, because you, you were talking to me about, you know, you don't want to get sued. This is All this stuff is facts. And I would love somebody to challenge me to take a polygraph. I'm serious because every single thing I'm saying is absolutely. Well, what I tell you about Mark Twain, he says, only tell the <laughs> truth that people deserve it. To de that That's deserve a great lie. I think people deserve it. Uh, he he opened the according to him. I don't know if this is 100 percent true because people exaggerate. He it was his idea to have the Central Music Festivals. Ron Delster might have a different opinion, but they opened it together. And after my father decided to have a place on Hilly's on Ninth Street, he spent a lot of time there and Ron wanted to get rid of him. So he gave him a contract. Uh, Rheingold was the sponsor of at the right. time. And in the fine print, it said if it changes sponsorship, he'll get nothing. Ten thousand dollars at that time was more like. 50 a hundred thousand it was a lot more money then so sure. he it was he, he didn't get the money because he signed the contract without reading the fine print and he lost it and then yeah. and then he then after that he was in hilly's on ninth street yes do, do you do you have any record because the the um that music festival the central park music the the wrangle which i think later was uh Rheingold. Sponsor. I think it was, it was Schaefer. And that's later, it was Schaefer and then Dr. That's Pepper. why he didn't get the money. Yeah. But any recollections? I mean, some of those yes. shows were, were any, any it, was, it was fun. Ron, Ron wanted to be the boss. He probably didn't want my father there and didn't want my mother there. I remember him arguing. He said, What is your wife doing here? I, I mean, it was kind of. But I saw the Beach Boys and the Little Rascal. No, it was the Little Rascals or the. What am I saying? Maybe I'm no, saying. The, um, Prince, yeah, the Rascals. Something. The, the, the rascals. rascals. Maybe it wasn't the, the little rascals. Maybe that's yeah, a TV yeah. show. I, it yeah. was a lot of. It was very exciting. Giant crowds. It was really yeah. fun. Yeah, and it was. Uh, it was. It was very exciting. And then your dad got pushed out when they when well, they he changed. Got, when he they, got tricked. It's a fact. He, a fine yeah. point. Is is a, it's a trick, but there's no arguing. That's oh, the man. young rascals, the young rascals. Oh, Thank the young you, rascals, the young rascals. Yeah, yeah. He didn't read the fine print. He should he should have read the fine print, but he didn't. So he, he so so um he's he's involved with the Central Park uh with with the music festival. Did he open his first um bar, Hillies? Uh, was that open at the same time or did one come after the other? I think he opened it at the same time and he was spending so much time there that Ron probably complained that he was there so much. But I, I don't I don't know. I think Ron wanted it for himself. Ron became a, a multimillionaire. So yeah. so I think my father wanted to do both. But that's what happened. And then he went to Hilly's on Ninth Street. And and. Well, this thing with the Rockettes, my mother, we were on a farm by then, uh, my grandparents' farm, and my mother didn't understand why my, my, my father wasn't coming home. And, 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 you know, I didn't have a resentment about it because I didn't know any better for years. But well, I you went were, to You dinner. were young, right? You were a young yeah, kid. But my father brought me to New York, and he went out to dinner. We had cherry pie with this, I can't think of her name, this Rockette. I didn't know he was sleeping with her. I found out. That's why he didn't come home because he had other places to sleep. So my mother had a nervous breakdown because uh, she didn't understand where my father was. And then they would have these fights in the house. They lived across from my grandparents. And, you know, it was disturbing to me. Uh, I, I didn't understand what was going on. Well, that's so tough. it was, that, it that was stuff is that's not unusual having a yeah. family like that. It's just not unusual. Yeah. I mean that's disturbing stuff for a young, for for a young child. The the first incarnation of Hillies before it was moved to Hillies on the Bowery and eventually uh, renamed CBGBs. Where was the first bar? It Hillies? was Hillies on 62 West Ninth Street, up up the corner from where I am. Ah. And um, yeah, I, 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 there's a lot of really that was really fun. It, it actually was a is kind of a famous place. Bet Midler. And yeah. JJ Walker and and Novella Nelson and, and this more uh, were were in a showcase there. And William Hickey, the Godfather from Prince's Honor, 
was uh, directed the showcase. My mother took over when he became too busy, and and there's stories about that I can tell you briefly. You Wait, know, whoa, 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 whoa! William Hickey, down. William, H- William, no, 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 William Hooky, as in, do you want to? Not Hooky, Hickey. I, I have a cookie. I don't want to play Hooky. William Hickey. William Hickey. Yes. Would do you want a cookie? That William Hickey from Prizzy's Honor. Oh, you remember that? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. My Pris- mother, oh, he was, because he my Pris- mother studied with Herbert. She was in Herbert Burghoff's class, which is the most advanced class you can get into. And Bill Hickey was William Hickey was Bill Herbert Burghoff's prodigy. So my mother studied acting. So that's wow. how she was qualified to run the improv. And and she taught me something when I ended up in the future. I'll tell you about the directing. Basically, a very simple thing, which they don't do in most films now. If, if uh, and she follow follow the truth, she wanted the truth in the comedy, and that's basic simple thing. And that's how, that's that's a way of making something very good. Just follow. If the you truth. don't know who, if you don't know who William Hickey is, look it up. Prizzy's Honor. The guy, the guy was, uh, the guy was one of the great actors of that era. He was a very nice man. He was nicer. He was so unrealistic sometimes. He was so nice. He didn't see bad in almost anybody. And he right. he 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 saw the Hey Michael he, Alex. Very Michael good guy. Alex, my friend Michael Alex, who was one of the producers in the Alago film I did, he knows Bill Hickey. That's right. Bill Hickey. They called him Bill. I, I went to his I, I went to his was class. That right? Was he in Christmas was he in Christmas vacation as well? I don't remember. I I, yeah, I just Fritzy yeah. Zana was the win we was nominated oh, he was great for in that. best he was supporting great. actor. Yeah. But but so so anyway they had the they had the well okay I'll wait for you to ask uh, yeah so so so, so Hillies the the initial Hillies is on Ninth Street um and and it was it was your your mom it was your mom's uh mom's your mom's money back the opening of that right yes and I can say this this is a fact everybody knows or most people know I don't know if you know this but a lot of people. The mafia ran the jukeboxes all over the city, maybe all over the country. So my father also, they owed him money, and my father wanted the money. But they said they would kill us. I guess my father must have liked us somewhat because when they said they would kill us, he stopped asking for the money because that would have helped <laughs> keep the place open. And, right. and, and the and the, the, the showcase, uh, well, David Brenner was – somebody that used to talk to me when he failed. So the was, it, what, what, was there like uh, uh, on the initial Hillies on Nice Street, there was like a stage and, and like people. Performed there was a stage in the back and there's a beautiful ki- high, what skylight in the back. And mm-hmm. there was the giant ladder, which because the bullshit about the canopy that my mother painted, that giant black ladder actually went to CBGB's and wow. I held the ladder when my mother pa- did all the painting. But but that was in the back room and all these pictures, the posters that you see on the walls of CBGB's, they, of these famous old time actors, they were on the wall and they had the showcase and they actually had a thing where um, singing, where my mother sang. My father was a fantastic voice, but they didn't, I don't know, they didn't think he was uh, affable or personal enough. So he didn't his records didn't do very well. So one time my mother decided to sing, she sang, uh, Oh, I wish I could, I have it written down, uh, mm-hmm. but it, it, she's, uh, uh, Oh, Johnny comes marching home. I remember it. See, I'm not see now. Sure. Uh, and, <laughs> and she sang it and she sang it because she's an actress. She knew how to sing it. And the audience will, you know, they got really excited. And uh, of course, after that, my father ended the showcase. My fa- mother was getting attention. That's, uh, you know, every time my mother got, you know, he ended it. He didn't like my mother getting attention because it got was him. It, it now, wasn't Karen's. N- n- now, so, so, oh, somebody yeah. asked, somebody asked uh, Val asked, does, did, is there any, did Hilly, is there any records with Hilly on it? Yeah, there's, there's Far Away Stars and Man of the Sky. Really, really good. You'll hear how good his voice is. It's a fantastic voice. But he didn't, for some reason, you need more than that to yeah. sell a record. I, I, he was he was too maybe gruff or didn't talk enough. I don't know what it was, but you need a lot of, you need bullshit. Like, I have bullshit, but I'm not a great singer. You need yeah. both to be a, 
you, you we, know, we, we, we all we all know that it's not just enough to be a hustler and it's not just enough to be an incredible talent. You sort of need a combination of both. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and I'm not sure how much things have changed, even though people think they've changed. I'm not sure they, they have changed that yeah. much in that way. Yeah, I, so, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, they haven't they haven't changed, haven't changed that much. So so. What do you think was the impetus for Hilly to, to shutter uh, the, 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 the original location on 9th Street and move move it to... He was Avalu running out of money. If ah. the mafia paid him back, right. he, he would have had another 10, 20... I, I think it would be 10,000 10, at the time was like 50,000. So he, he was running out of money. And he opened the place, which I told you, I think it's kind of funny that he would do this. I mean... He said he says it was Hilly's on 13th Street. He at the same time as Hilly night Hilly's and Night she was closing, he opened a place called Picks. That's what it said on the sign. But he tells people it was called Hilly's, which is part of him being, you know, a lot of people have this Donald Trump syndrome, even though he I'm sure he's a much nicer person than Donald Trump. But he he he, he opened 13th Street and while Hilly's and Nitro is open, he also opened Hilly's on the Bowery, even though then Hilly closed soon thereafter. Right. So here's kind of the first ad that I've seen that that it, it looks like it might have been from the Village Voice. You know, oh, right? I, right I, have, I couldn't find that stuff. I don't know. Yeah. How you so, it. so right below the sort of inner sanctum New York's swinging couples night is an ad for Hilly's on the Bowery with uh, ch it presents Chuck Wayne and Joe Puma. Uh, 315 Bowery. My, my, I'm assuming here that this is this is like 19, you know, I don't know, 1971 or two, maybe. I don't know. Uh, no, uh, uh yeah, 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 yeah. Most of the Hillies in the Bowery was between 1971 and 1970, 1970, 1973. So I'm not sure exactly when that was. Yeah. So he, he, he lands on the Bowery and uh, opens, opens Hillies on the Hillies on the Bowery. What was uh, uh, what was the impetus for him to change the name to CBGB? Oh, that this is uh, interesting. I want people to know this because this is completely covered up. This is why I mentioned polygraph because he doesn't tell people this, and neither did my sister. He he had three partners. One of them's name was Ronnie Mintz, a lawyer. I forgot the two others. So I remember this stuff. I remember all kinds of detail, which is not very good for your brain to remember this stuff. I mean, for your sanity. But he he wanted to get rid of his three partners. So his lawyer, Charlie Carrera, said, you can't do that without getting a new owner. I think, I'm not sure if the term was fraud or I don't know the reason. I don't know if it was fraud, but he needed to get a new owner because he wanted to get rid of them because they weren't putting in enough money, according to what he said. So he asked my mother to do it. My mother said no, which is smart. But he then he said to me in his voice, I, he has a bass voice, he said, I, he said it to me and my mother, but the first way he said it to me, when my mother was standing there, he said, you think you're doing this for me? You think I'm doing this for me? He said, for, you think I'm doing this for me? I'm doing this for you, Karen and Lisa. Well, that's another reason why I was always mad at my father. And I said, he cheated her. He never did. He never helped my mother. And he only helped me at the end. Uh, somewhat. But he, he, he did not do it for us. He did it for himself, for his name. Because, well, I'll get into that later. Why? He, it's not that he didn't do good things and he wasn't basically good to people. But he was terrible with my mother. So my mother became the owner. She got nothing. So she was legally responsible for everything. She's mm -hmm. the only one that could go to jail. So when people, you know, I, when they resent my mother or people make comments, my mother was responsible and didn't get any money. She wasn't Leona Helmsley. She had she didn't get anything. She was legally responsible and got nothing. And my father knew that he could get away with it. He used to say the house manager, he says, your mother, like, like he's doing my mother a favor. He says, he says, you I could have got anybody to put their name in the license. 
Well, that's not true because he said he would have gotten Merv, the house manager. Merv passed away from cancer. His wife would have gotten it. And anybody with any brains, I, and my mother had brains, but she didn't want to disturb anything. She didn't want to disturb the family. Would have sued him because my mother never got paid. Merv would have sued. Everybody would have sued. They got nothing. He didn't give anything. So my mother was in this situation. And look, I was friendly with Jimmy Gestapo. He was very, you know, because he was kind of like a rock star with the hardcore. But, you know, he and a lot of people complained. You know what? What pisses me off about a lot of things is there wouldn't have been a CBGB's without my mother. My father says he could have got anybody, but he wouldn't have done it or he would have had to share it. So my mother was there wouldn't everybody was more important than all those hardcore bands, even though they're important because they couldn't have been the place for them to play without my mother. So anyway, I'll be, we'll, quiet. we'll, we'll, we'll get to the hardcore. We'll get to the hardcore. I'm just saying yeah. that one thing was part of the other, but I'll slow down. Yeah. I'll stop. So I'm let me just so say here, why my mother was so important. It couldn't have opened without her. That's right. So okay. let me ask you, and I know this is sort of folklore or, or, or whatever, but uh, where did the name CBGB come from? And, and what does it mean, CBGB? Ooh, I was club. standing outside the club and my father was saying, what is it called? Heebie-jeebie, 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 CBGB. I was standing there. He might have been thinking about it in the house. That, that's where it came from. I don't know. He was putting words together and that's what he thought of. Mm. I, I don't know. He didn't explain the re. Oh, well, what it meant was country bluegrass blues. Right. And other music for uplifting gourmandizers. He wanted a country bluegrass cl club with right. blues and other music, which could be anything, and gourmet food. That's that's the idea of CBGBs. Did CBGBs serve food early on? Did, didn't they have yes. Hillier, Jeff Hillier Pearson something? from Hillies on 9th Street, uh, who's in my story, uh, he, he came over and cooked a little. So did... Billy, who who got rid of the uh, cook, uh, he got rid of uh, Pearson. Sort of took over, uh, you know, intimidated uh, uh, Billy and left. And then and then I cooked a little bit, but I wasn't the chef. So yeah, it served food, but it never had gourmet food. Pearson what, was the cook. Wasn't it? Wasn't it? Why do I remember chili? Was there chili? Did CBGBs have chili? Yeah. You know, you know, I just want to tell you, it all started on Hilly's. There's a lot of things on Hilly's on 9th Street. So, uh, uh, but it, 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 see, at the beginning, my father borrowed money from a lot of people. And he usually, I don't know if he ever paid it back. Kenny, who later on, I was supposed to, well, I was supposed to go meet with Mickey Rourke because he was interested. Bill William Hickey, who you were impressed by. Bill Hickey. Wrote, sent a letter to... Uh, Mickey Rourke uh, 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 and saying he thought he would win an Academy Award for playing Kenny. Kenny was somebody, uh, 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 an eccentric person that borrowed money from my father. So, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. My father borrowed money from Kenny. So, I mean, I got it completely backwards, I'm not thinking. So, Kenny was part of the whole thing of Hillies on, on Ninth Street. And then Hillies on the Bowery. Gil was the bartender who seemed kind of like a Howard Stern in a way. Big, he, he used to, and they, in my story that I originally wrote and burned, one, Gil was the bartender and he had a storefront and he wanted me to fight because I was in a boxing gym. And Kenny, since you can say it on your, wanted me to fuck. I didn't understand about fucking. I, I was scared. But fighting, I understood because I was in the boxing gym. So that's a lot of my story. <laughs> I, I didn't I fighting and trying to fuck, which I didn't know how to do, right. and and fighting, which I did know how to do. I got a lot of brutal fights. So but let me let me let me ask that, you about that was that's my entertaining part. That's the most entertaining stuff. The family stuff is kind of disturbing. That I like. I was part of it, but. There was, All right, was I'm reeling. I'm reeling you in. Let me. Ask, uh, somebody asked uh, about it smelling like chili and dog shit. And I'm going back to this this picture. Uh, people going on about oh, at the how beginning of CBGB. The the and I, I, and I remember this. I remember going in CBGB during the afternoon to at the time to, to talk to to book to talk to Louise 
about about booking, you know, hardcore shit or whatever. The fucking place there was dog shit. All, why was there dog shit all over CBGB? Did well, your dad see, fucking see, love because, dogs? Because you're going past Hillies and the Bowery, but this is related completely. Your question uh, is is leads into what I wanted to talk about because Joe Lynn Gill's girlfriend, or he called her old lady at the time. That's what bikers called their the girlfriends. It was a very kind of sexist thing. Uh, she had Salukis. She brought the Salukis to Hillies on the Bowery. So my father did what he did with me. He left me in the club to do whatever I want. I drank whatever I wanted. And he did the same thing with the Salukis. So the Salukis thought it was a good place to shit. So that's basically, they walked, they did, Jonathan and Jennifer did a lot of shitting. And then there was the chili in the back. Uh, and was yeah, that's basically was, what it was. Did he leave the dogs in from, the dogs, from Hillies the on dogs, the Bowery brought the dogs to my father? Were the dogs like guard dogs? Were they left there to protect No, them he place? just left them there, kind of like he ignored me. He just right. left them there. They, it wasn't good for their ears and everything. And, and that's mm -hmm. he just left them. Did, he it. left me there too. I was very confused. Got he it. just left them there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um let me ask you about let, let's get rolling and let me let me read let me read something to you this way I could get a, you know and then and then we could, then you could sort of if need be set the record straight or whatever okay so um in 1973 uh while the future CBGB was still Hillies two locals Bill Page and Rusty McKenna, McKenna convinced convinced Hilly Crystal to let them book concerts in February 74, Hilly booked a local band, Squeeze, to a residency playing Tuesdays and Wednesdays. The clubs changed from country, the clubs changed from country and bluegrass to original rock bands. Squeeze was led, was led by guitarist Mark Saul, later with CBGB quasi house band, the, the Revelons, which included Fred Smith of Television and J.D. Doherty of the, of the Patti Smith Group. Although these bands did not play punk rock, they helped lay its foundation. When the Mercer Arts Center closed, which was a couple blocks away, then Television Suicide, The Fast, Jane County, The Ramones started playing CBGB. Could you give us some perspective on that? Yeah, I was told that's not accurate. Okay. Uh, uh, that Jane County was there. What is Jane County's name? Jane County. Wayne? Uh, Wayne. Yeah. Jane County was... a. Uh, uh, well, everybody knows this. This is a, you can't get sued for this. Jane's proud of it. Jane was a transvestite, or I'm not mm -hmm. sure if he used the word that, but he was supposedly he was there at the end of Hillies on the Bowery. So that's not true. So according to what I was told, I didn't pay attention sometimes. He was there before those bands. But uh, the, the thing about it was Nathaniel, a friend of mine's son, interviewed me. This is how it got in Wikipedia. And I said, the people that brought the, it was not Richard Lloyd or television that brought the music, the unusual punk music to CBGBs. It was Rusty McKenna and Bill Page. And it doesn't mean it wouldn't have happened anyway, because he had the Central Rock Music Festival. He liked right. rock. But basically, Rusty brought uh, Bill Page. She said, my father has to meet this guy. And he kept nagging my father, you know, to to have this unusual music, which was punk rock. They didn't know it at the time. And that that's how it started. It, it was uh, basically he listened to Bill Page. Not that other people didn't tell him that, but that's that's how it started. That's the yeah. real way it started. So when Richard, you want to ask me, I'll tell you what. Richard Lloyd says in his book, yeah. Richard Lloyd is pretty nice. Well, no, I know Richard Lloyd doesn't say they were wandering around the Bowery and they wandered into this place and, is, is, and, and they needed. Well, a he says to two things that I was disappointed in him saying, should I tell you? He yeah, said yeah. it bothered me. He says he walked in and he saw my father. I think he said painting the canopy. No, my mother painted the Hillies on the Bowery canopy and CBGB. She won an art scholarship to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. She also went to Harvard. So she was, a lot of it was her brains. So she painted it. And so when Richard says he saw my father, 
I think he said painting. That's absolutely never happened. Then he says it just uh, some weird coincidence. Then after he saw my father doing the canopy, he said in the book, then he suggested my father have rock and roll. It's just kind of bullshit. They all go together, but it's, that's, look, he probably, of course, he suggested his band plays there, but he has nothing to do with, that's not how it started. And the canopy was all my mother. And my mother, even after she had the f uh, designs of, 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 the, of the canopy, I started to pick them up. My father grabbed them from me. He said, they're mine. They weren't his. They were my mother's. And and actually, here's a story. And don't worry, you can't get sued for this. It's 100% factual. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, you know, because you were concerned. Cosmo, after several months when CBGB's opened, this really happened. I'll give Cosmo the credit for this. He came in with, with designs of the canopy that had the shirt t-shirt on it, which almost every club, I think, or famous place had t-shirts. So it wasn't an original idea. But so I said to Cosmo, I said, where did you get the designs from? This is why I don't agree with Cosmo that he says he designed the t-shirt. He said, I copied the canopy. He, he copied the canopy. So he wanted money for his design that he copied. So I said, well, first of all, my mother was the legal owner of the whole thing. So why should he get, so of course, every time he went, he tried to get a lawyer, to do, he couldn't do anything about it. So when I am arguing on the internet, you could look it up saying, well, my mother designed the canopy and someone else is saying, no, Cosmo did. Well, Cosmo did what he did. He copied it and made a design, but my mother made the first design and he copied the canopy. Those are exact words. So I just want people to make it clear. Copy, Cosmo did contribute by copying my mother's artwork. It happens. It's right true. on. Could you give us some perspective on, you know, this band who are so closely uh, associated with CBGB? Like, uh, could you tell us a little bit about oh, the Ramones? Yeah. They were really good musicians. And I really got, there's a lot of people. I, I guess I'm the anti uh, punk. Mm -hmm. People, uh, I, I didn't like them. Well, Johnny was right wing, and Dee Dee called my mother a bitch. And when he says in that, I saw something when I went to the bathroom. I saw a little bit of it talking about he could have blown the place, uh, whatever, with the music. Well, the point is, they the Block Association, I have the papers in my apartment that I could show anybody. Uh, well, uh, And they wanted to close the place down because it was so noisy. So when he says, and when my father says, oh, it's better when it's loud. Well, my father's going against keeping the club open when he says that. And when when Dee Dee and uh, uh, I think it was Danny Fields didn't like them. My mother, I think they say she pulled the plug. I wasn't there that time, but that's what people say when they were playing. It probably was. It might have been during a sound check. I'm not sure, but it, it might have been during the show. The point is she was trying to help the club stay open. She was fighting with the block association saying she would get them to turn the music down. The Ramones didn't want to turn music down. So when they get mad at my mother, they just, look, I have a very big prejudice against a lot of musicians that were mad at her. She kept the club open. And then she ended up convincing my father to get soundproofing. That's, that's, I mean, they probably decided that on their own, but my mother is the one that was, they were going to court. They were trying to get the club closed and I have all the papers and everything. Who, that. who, out of these, like sort of the the first wave of these bands that came through there, who did you like? I liked Patti Smith. I thought television was really good, and they were pretty nice, too. I mean, I like Richard Lloyd. He's a really nice guy. I was surprised mm -hmm. when he said that in his book because basically he wouldn't say bad things about my mother. He's a pretty nice guy. So mm -hmm. I basically I wore, I like Richard Lloyd. I like the whole band television i thought i liked them i didn't love them i liked them i liked the talking heads i don't think the talking heads were very good when when and when david byrne went on his own i don't think they were very good i don't think david byrne is a very good musician on his own i think the whole band together are really good i i it's kind of weird that people i don't think he's very good on his own i don't it's but i like the talking heads and i i thought the ramones were really good i just didn't like them as people most of them. Well, here's, I a shot, like here's a shot of the police playing uh, 
CBGB right here. I think. Uh, yeah, I think I was there. Yeah, they and people yeah. didn't. Most people didn't know who they were. Right. They yeah. That but was so, interesting. So you hear about the police. You know, ACDC played there. Le legendary. Um, uh, here's here's two other ones. Then there's there is the dictators, right? There's the dictators, and there's uh, suicide. I mean, these are these are bands that you know. You're skipping Hillies on the Bowery, but I can't make you at your show. But you know, there was a lot. Of, you know, when when if they make a film and they make and they people read my story, they'll see that I, I was always trying to prove that Hillies and the Bowery is more interesting than CBGBs. If they read my book, they'll see why. Mm -hmm. Because Gil, the bartender, used to have terrify people when he had a Hell's Angel party. He, Gil was a real character. That's why I mentioned Howard Stern. Even though I don't like a lot of things Howard Stern did, he was a Gil was a real instigator bartender from Hillies and the Bowery. And Kenny, why would Mickey Rourke be interested in playing him? I was supposed to go see him if they if they weren't fascinating characters. So I felt the fascinating story is the hidden story. So you're talking about what happened afterwards. But since you mentioned the dictators, I could jump ahead. Dick Manitoba was a pretty nice guy, but Dick and uh, who else was it? Oh. Chris Stein invited me over to his loft. I came over to his loft. When I when I talked about my father, uh, Dick Manitoba said, you know, that's family infighting. You know, uh, the, well, the reason why that's, I don't like they say that is, and and, and Chris Stein said the force was, see, was hilly. It's absolutely true. The force, main force of the whole thing was, I think he used the word force, was hilly but he couldn't have done it without my mother. So when they don't, she's part of the history, the hidden, it's kind of, they try to hide it. So all these musicians that they might not even want me on their show because they don't want me criticizing my father, but it couldn't, you know what I don't like about these. I personally don't like about them, even though they were pretty nice to me is they couldn't have had, CBGBs without my mother. So I, I kind of think, well, they're very ungrateful. Even Jesse Mallon, who introduced me to you, really mm -hmm. nice guy. I asked him, I called him up. I, he usually answered me when I called, but I asked him about a memorial for my mother. He didn't call me back that time because people were mad. Look, he, he told me that my mother called. Uh, 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 and I know you're watching, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, no, but but Jesse was really nice to me. Always nice to me. Jesse's the greatest. I, from, uh, what, what's Murphy's Law? What's his name again? Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy G. I mean, Jimmy I, G. I mean, a Jewish person. I, I don't think I saw why he used the name. He thought it would he doesn't go. He doesn't use that moniker anymore. He put okay, that. Okay, but that's he, something he where I think that. a Jewish guy could think that's really very right. bad taste to use that name. They were terrible people. So Jimmy Gestapo, according to what I was told uh, by Jesse, told me. Uh, he and my mother used to, well, I heard this from several people too, but with other people, she used to call their parents. Well, Jimmy Gestapo, really good, really big star, very nice, very friendly. He was nice to me. He nice. He resented my mother. Does Jimmy Gestapo, do you really realize as you're listening to this that you would have no hardcore without my mother? All these people that didn't like my mother, that she called their parents, she kicked Jimmy Gestapo after he had six or seven fights. The, he has the record. Let, this let's, not, let's move on past. Well, well I just want to get know, to the end of this. Jimmy I want to get to the end of this. Okay. Nothing would have happened without my mother. So my mother kicked him out temporarily for a week or two. Big deal. The place wouldn't exist. Your, your, mother, your, mother I had kicked, a fight. your mother kicked a lot of people out temporarily. And you know something? The When I had a fight, when everybody else had a fight, my father banned me for months. Nobody, he, Jimmy Gestapo has the record. He knows it for the most fights in the, that period of time of anybody. He should, I guess he, maybe he's proud of it. But of course he, she, she, he, he, she temporarily kicked him out like anybody. I'm throwing do. the flag. Here's a okay. shot of, of the Runaways. The Runaways in 1976 yeah. playing CBGB with those big, look at those, amp, yo, for everybody out there, look at those Ampeg cabinets they're playing. Look, uh, look Ampeg is oh, on oh, the left. Uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Orange is on the right. Man, what a, what a loud She was set. a good singer. She yeah. was a really good singer. Oh, you remember her? 
No, what's her name? Uh, Joan Jerry, Jett. Joan Jett. Yeah. So I, wasn't I'm, that I'm, Joan? Jett, isn't that Joan Jett? Yes. Yes. So listen, I, I got, I have something different uh, to ask you about. Um, CBGB starts doing stuff. It becomes sort of a focal point for a lot of things. And then your dad opens up the CBGB theater on 2nd Avenue and 4th Street in a former Yiddish vaudeville theater. Do you have any recollections or any perspective yeah, on the CBGB See, my CBGB perspective is thing? so different than yours or most people's because, well, I won't go into it yet till you ask me, but, but the, I'm not going to go into this. I'm going to mention it if you want me to go in. But before the theater, they – they had original music and Danny Fields, I heard him say this uh, long years later, they thought the original music came because they, uh, because my father was a genius. And even in the New York times thought that it was absolutely, it was because BG was at the door. BG told my mother as caps coming around, they want money for mm -hmm. cover songs. My mother went to my father. I think it was her suggestion. They did it on, they did it together. And they decide they have to have original music, not to pay cover songs. So, so when when the thing with the theater happened, which was afterwards, I'm just trying to go before. Mm -hmm. um, I resented that because he never paid my mother back any of the money. So he's opening a theater, and he never had money to pay my mother because he was always spending it on something else. So for me, people are interested in the theater. I understand that, but my perspective to be sincere about this is I was always mad. Why is he opening a theater when when my uh when my mother didn't get paid? So yeah, he opened the theater and, and he, had here's his, here's, his here's what it was originally. Uh, eventually it was the Anderson Theater, but this yes, is Anderson this is theater. this is it like in, in the heyday. It was a beautiful old uh like vaudeville theater that that actually well, the building is the building the building's Anderson. still there. The building's still yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, Patty Smith complained that um, the fire department showed up. Yeah, because, uh, because so I won't no, mention, this, from what I understand, there was no that's permit. That's story. It, it, he brought in, a, he brought in a, a generator and ran the cables through the front door for power. And there was like, it was, it, was a, it was actually a dangerous building, apparently. I don't know. According to my father, so I'm not saying this because you're, you're afraid of getting, you were a little concerned of getting sued. I'm not saying this happened, but I was told by a lawyer, I'm allowed to say someone else said this. And this is the truth. Uh, that's why I mentioned polygraph. My father thought Ron Delster and some of the other promoters were jealous and, and called the fire department. What he didn't know is I'm not going to mention his name. A photographer friend of mine said he, that lived across the street. He knows who he is, said to me, if they open a the and he was my father's friend. He said, if they open that theater, I'm going to call. I'm going to yell. I'm going to complain. I think he said the fire department. According to him, I think he's, he called the fire department. My father thought it was the big time promoters that called the fire department. And now you're giving a different reason. You're saying there were violations. But Patty Smith said, Hilly got to get his shit together. I remember hearing that. Gotcha. It, it's kind of, it was kind of fun. In a way, it was fun, but there was a lot of controversy in the whole thing, and, and it didn't last. Oh, here's the thing. Here, here's kind of interesting. When the theater closed, it didn't stay open very far long. No, every it was single weekend. Every, every single word I'm saying when I'm repeating someone's words, it happened. I, I really wish people would challenge me and give me a polygraph if they question it. My father said it. My father closed because the millionaires that were his partners in the theater. He had partners in the theater, went to California. My father said, you call that legal larceny. My father, this is his exact words. He was not the saintly guy in the movie. He had a very good side that people liked, but he said, I'd like to blow their heads off if he could. And you know, my reaction to that, I didn't say it to him. I don't think I said it to him. Maybe I did, which would make him mad. You want to, so you think those people deserve to be killed because they cheated you. He called it legal larceny because they left and he they knew he didn't have the money for the theater. But you never paid mom. You never shared any of the things. This, the club was not for me, my sister, and my father. It was for my sister because she kissed my father's ass and I was for my mother. Basically, he, he cheated my mother and me, but my mother was worse. 
and he wants to blow their heads off. So I, I, I had a very big antagonistic feeling about my father's, uh, the whole thing, every, and the musicians, everything happened because of my mother and my father. And, and, and he was, and he was infuriated that he was. Cheating. All right. I'm wrestling it back to the ground. Okay. 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 I just let's, want you to let's know. Talk, I am let's talk feeling. about the, the, the legendary CBGB bathroom. Did, did, was it, was it, was it, was it on purpose left? Like, Oh to be yeah. Yeah. Season? This is exaggerated. Like, is it, it got much worse for the movie. So when people think this is the legendary bathroom, well, when they made the movie, uh, the flop movie that they made, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they, th 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 that, that was my idea that they ruined. That was, uh, that was, that was most, they, they made it much different for the movie before the movie. There wasn't all that graffiti. There was some, and the doors were open because they didn't want them doing drugs because see what happened was, is that I, right? Is that why, is that why? Is that why it wasn't no, like no, this before the movie? This, no, this is this, a, is this isn't from the movie. This is from the, the club. No, after the movie, they, right. they, 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 they use, they, they made, they, they, they did this. They, they took this design and, and they, they, and they made it on a set, but it wasn't like this before the movie. It uh -huh. wasn't, it wasn't when they made the movie, they, the bathrooms got like the movie. I don't know how or why, but it was not like that for years it was bad but it was never like this mm -hmm. and and what happened was um well i i could wait for you to see if you ask me Let, there was a in in the cbgb's uh, i think it was 1978 or 1980 i think i'm not sure this is was, this is the bathroom this is joy ramon in the bathroom right so but that didn't is, happen till the time of the movie it didn't happen it was not that bad it was not that bad. No, most of the time it was not that bad. Uh -huh. The time of the movie, they they either imitated, they imitated the movie, and they made this. It was not nearly as crazy as this. No, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. This is this this happened because they were trying to create an image. It was it's exaggerated. I'm not saying the bathroom wasn't bad, but it was the it, it was it got a lot of likes on what Facebook uh, like it, that's why they did it. It got attention, uh -huh. but. Anyway, that that's look. It's not. It's, it's exagger. It's just an exaggeration. It, it it was not like that. No, that's exaggerated. Okay. It became like that at the time of the movie. Wasn't Joey dead by the time the movie came out? Yeah. So these pictures are. I, I don't remember. I do know. I do know that there was a the St. Mark's Church benefit with Lenny K. Mm. I, I want people to know this. You can't get sued for this. This is a fact. And I went up to Lenny K and I said, and I showed him the beginning of my story. I had a journal and he said, and I'm not trying to brag. This is what he said. He said, this is perfect. Cause it was about Skid Row walking into the Bowery with my father, like called punk rock bar. And he read it on stage. And I didn't know this, but my sister, I mean, this is just a fact. You can't, copied it from the soundboard and it looks like she used that in the beginning of the movie so my so the movie so a lot of the idea of the movie came from i i think i feel it came from copying my story in 78 i started writing this story when i was the, the, a lot of my journal i i was writing my whole life so so a lot of this stuff was a distortion of it, the movie was a distortion of I wanted people to know about Hillies and the Bowery that wasn't in the movie, which I appreciate because you said you're not doing this very much. But you did say to me when we first met that you'd ask me about Hillies and the Bowery. And I, I did. Wanted, and we talked about it. But there's a big story here to tell. But and there's CBGB's a lot of things to, to me. Is, we, can't spend an hour, we can't spend an hour talking about Hillies and the Bowery. We're talking but Hillies, about the CBGB's you're talking mostly about anniversary. CBGB's. You're you're mostly interested in CBGBs and Hillies on the Bowery was much more interesting to me. That's mm -hmm. what we, we're talking almost ex mostly well talking almost exclusively about CBGBs. I understand because it is the CBGB 50th anniversary and that. But is it wouldn't have happened without Hillies on the Bowery and what came before. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's a better. It's going to be a bigger story. I think it's a more interesting story. Let well, no, it won't, it won't be bigger because CBGBs is very famous. But I think it's a more interesting story. The, the CBGB story you already heard before. It, it's just you're asking me stuff that people heard already. 
Most. I'm taking a sponsor break. Uh, okay. It'll be a couple minutes. Let me get. Let me do the sponsor break, and we'll come back in a couple minutes, and we will continue in our quest talking about uh, Hillies on the Bowery, CBGBs at fifty. Karen I Kirsten. still. We don't have to agree on everything. I still like you. I know. I still like you too. But really, I still. I still like you too, and, and I have to step in and throw the flag every now. And oh, then. I understand. Yeah. All right. I'll see you in a couple minutes. Okay. All right. There you have it. Told you it was going to be a buck and Bronco. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Let's hear from some sponsors and we'll get right back to it. Peace. What it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Me Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, the pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. <laughs> We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it off. Oh! Will that be cash or in debt? Do you mean debit? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Another eternal satisfying customer. <laughs> Guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do, and we are happy to see you guys. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections of music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram. That's right. We're back at it again. Put your dukes up. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is Dana Crystal. We're talking about CBGB's 50th anniversary. We're going deep. We're getting weird. Um, uh, Brendan Rafferty, SFA, did, I'm late. Did I miss anything? Uh, yeah, I'd say you missed quite a bit. Uh, but don't worry, we still have another hour to go. Uh, that said, um, everybody okay? Uh, what did I see? I love this. Chris Hoffman. I'm tripping on mushrooms, and this is fucking great. <laughs> Listen, if you're out there and you're tripping on anything, this show's going to be great. This is the New York Harco Chronicles Live. I want to talk about a few upcoming shows. A week from a, a week, a week from today. Actually, this Saturday. Uh, I'll be up in Albany, uh, Biohazard, uh, Brick by Brick, Concrete Ties, and more at Empire Live. And then I'm scooting back right after they get off stage because a week from today, we got Drew Thomas from Bold Crippled Youth into another Dead Heavens and Ex Pollutants on the show. A couple days after that, really looking forward to this one from Conservative Military Image, Adam Voss will be on the show. Then there is a little bit of a break because... We are going out, Incendiary Device is going to be out in California playing a couple shows. And then we come back. Believe me when I tell you, 
I need a little break from doing the show. So there's going to be, I think, uh, one of those very rare uh, week and a half breaks. We come back Sunday, March 17th with Paris Mayhew of Agros, formerly of cro celebrating the release of Skateboard Fight music video. A couple days later, uh, Mike Score from All Out War will be on the show. Sunday, March 31st, Phil P- Puleo from Cop Shoot Cop and the Swans, the children, and that's far enough. Wednesday, April 3rd is Bob Japardi from Concrete Marketing, Cliff from The Freeze on Wednesday, April 10th, and John Connolly of Nuclear Assault, co-hosted by Howie Abrams on Sunday, April 14th. So there's lots going down. Uh, One week from today is Drew Thomas. We'll see you back here for that, unless, unless I see you up in Albany. And very excited about the biohazard show up in Albany, uh, working on the biohazard top secret project, which isn't that top secret anymore. Uh, Just a reminder to please support the show. Um, There's a Patreon page. There's a PayPal address. Do a super chat function. I want to shout out latest and greatest patrons. Uh, You around, Walter White. Jason Vitter- Vitteridi, uh, Edward Krasuski, and the latest patron, Kitty. Man, let me give you people stage names, for Christ's sake, and make it easy. You know? But thank you. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for being a patron. Um, couldn't do it without you. And that's what's up. And all you other people that are watching the show, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, that said... Uh, what else I want to mention? Hey, follow me on Instagram, uh, IG, uh, Instagram, Stone Films NYC. Uh, subscribe to the, if you're watching the channel in a rerun, please hit the like button. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, also hit the like button right now. Do it now if, you, if you're watching uh, the show. Also, I want to say, I said this on the, other, the last show we did, and, and it was a deluge of people. I just want to say, yo, you can reach out to me anytime. I'm very accessible. If you want to talk about your band, you want to talk about uh, anything and everything. Um, I said that at the last show and I got about 30 messages. And uh, that's just how it is. That's just that's just the life I chose. So if you're out there and you got a question or you want to you want to point out a band or your band or whatever, I'm here. Reach out. That said, um, Thank you for following me all over. Um, that's it. Oh, my patience today is impressive. Listen, I knew. Listen, my friend, my friend Dana Crystal, I knew what we were getting into. Let's bring him back on. Hey, man. I knew. Uh, I, I, I knew. I knew what we were getting because into. Because you told me you were going to talk about Hillies on the Bowery, and you mostly, you did, but you mostly talked about CGBs. You know, David Brenner, by the way, and, 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 by the way, David Brenner, did I mention this? I thought this was a little funny. He used to fail the audition because he was, my mother thought he was not doing serious comedy. And he used to come out every time I'm standing in front of Hillies on 9th Street. He used to come out and I used to comfort him by lifting him up. I was 11, but I used to have to carry the beer cases upstairs. So I, I comfort him several times when he said, I failed, it said, I failed the audition again. So that's how I met David Brenner. I thought that was funny. And I also want to say, at the beginning of my story, which is not part of C, well, Ernie Regensburg was my friend. I when since I was ten years old, I'm still friends with him, and and he's the one who drove me up to the bridge on the back of his stolen stolen bicycle. It's kind of funny that in the story is thrown off the bridge, and that's how it. I went to New York. I, I Ernie took me across the bridge. So I just I want to mention Ernie because a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, the my my point, I guess I could say this pretty briefly is is here. It, this is pretty brief. Uh, I find it. Sorry. Well, it's that. Sorry. Oh, Come on. God. Time is money. Okay. Well, the 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 char- the peripheral characters of that pe- everybody knows the story of CBGBs. They don't know about the peripheral characters were not mentioned. I understand it's the 50th anniversary of CBGBs, but I guess I wrote about the peripheral characters that I thought were very interesting. And that's 
And and a lot of the, you know, people look at it a different way than I did. I I, I was, I, I, most people they look at it completely different. They they I look at it as I'm rebelling against people, the musicians, and and the way CBGBs was and how my mother was treated. And people are rebelling against some of them, their parents and society. I was doing at the beginning when it was Hillies on the Bowery, but the time it became CBGBs as time went by, I grew out of that. And now I was trying to defend the, the, what was happening, which is the situation with my mother. So, so we we're rebelling against two different things. I'm almost rebelling against the people in, 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 in CBGBs, but that's the truth. That's the way it is. Let me and, ask, let me, let me, let me ask you, let me steer it back a little bit. Um, is it true that, um, the two rules of early CBGBs were that a band must move its own equipment and play mostly original songs. Although, no, some, uh, although, asking, although some bands played a cover or two. No, that was, I told you, that was because uh, ASCAP came around and BG told my mother, you know, that uh, she came in and, and he said, ASCAP's here. And, and, and my mother went to my father you know, they they want cover music. That's the the reason had nothing to do with Danny Fields, who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, saying that it was my father's brilliant idea. The New York Times also, the paper of record, don't know what they're talking about. It had nothing to do with my father's genius. It had everything to do with my mother going to my father, repeating what BG said, that BG knows this happened, that uh, ASCAP wanted money for cover songs. So my mother and father decided that's how they saved the money. That's the reason. That's another thing that my father doesn't like to never didn't like. He didn't like to tell people. That's what hey, happened. Hey, did you this, get this, rid of ASCAP? This picture here, which is yes. taken in the alley behind CB's, um, with with yeah. I guess that, that I don't know if it's a storage unit or a truck that says CB's on it. But have you seen what this alley looks like these days? It didn't look like they always exaggerate. It didn't look. Mm -hmm that bad now it doesn't now it's all fancy and everything they fixed it but mm -hmm. this is uh you know they decorate things for just like they decorated the bathroom it so, was so the so you saying the alley back then didn't it was look bad like it was bad but it didn't look like this no they uh, exaggerate okay oh that's all it, it, a lot of things when you hear about cb a lot of it is exaggerated it, it doesn't mean it didn't happen it just means it's exaggerated uh -huh. it's just that's all yeah. Uh, how about uh, you ever hear of this band, Guns N' Roses? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, uh, I got a phone call uh, from, I think it was Louise, uh, my father's assistant, and uh -huh. it said, uh, uh, Axel Rose wants to borrow your guitar. I, I had a pretty crummy guitar because he, he, he wanted to do acoustic cassette in Hilly's on Night, uh, not Hilly's on, sorry. He, he wanted to do acoustic set in, in the gallery. And right. I didn't know I didn't know anything about Guns N' Roses. So I said, I'm not lending him my guitar, which was if I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't have done that because he he would have signed it and I would have got a few thousand dollars for it. So I shouldn't have said no. But I said no. I said no to a lot of things. I kicked Lou Reed out. I didn't know who he was. And after I threw him out because he tried to charge the door, uh, Somebody said, that's Lou Reed. I said, that's Lou Reed? But it was too late. I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, what I about didn't, the, I didn't what understand about the, a lot of things. What, what about the CBGB record canteen? What was that about? Uh, that was opened as, uh, what, the record canteen? And then it was, what was it before that? And then it became the CBGB gallery. That was just right. to have, uh, well, he wanted to sell records. It didn't do very well. The the T-shirts that made all the money that my mother designed, mm -hmm. that's what was supporting a lot of the club. And the T-shirts, I think, supported the gallery. The gallery wasn't making money. So I remember I remember eating pizza. Wasn't there a pizza place? Didn't you open a pizza place in there? Was there food? I'm not going to mention names, but there was an incident in the pizza place. I'm not going to mention the name. I'll be very brief about this. This girl in the pizza place would give me pizza and say her juices were in the pizza. She asked me to, she, and then I, and then she started calling me. I can, I say this word. She called me a pussy. So I, I called her the you same. You can say word. that on my show. I can. So yeah. I called her the same word back and my sister fired me. And, and, and if they ever talked to, uh, uh, 
it's just she denied everything. She she was she denied everything, and I got blamed. But I didn't make anything up. I, here, I we'll play, here, here we'll play. Look, is it? So I got in trouble. I got in trouble for something that she instigated. I was in her apartment. I was scared, and she's calling me a pussy because I was shy. So I I got fired for that. But that's that's a big incident in the pizza place. I a lot of things my father would blame me for. So that that went on for years. Uh, uh, Chris, I Hoff, Chris Hoffman asks. Isn't the story that Todd Youth had to get smuggled in a drum case because your mother banned him from the club? Which one? Todd Youth. Do you remember Todd Youth? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I just okay. know my mother was pretty strict. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I just here's, here's something since you mentioned hardcore. My mother doing the door, IDing people, calling their parents, all that stuff. Do you realize hardcore went on for approximately 10 years? when my mother did the door, as soon as my father said it got too violent, which it didn't change. It was always violent. Not always, but it was violent a lot. My father took over with Louise. It ended within weeks. So these people, I, I like to some, I'm just pissed off at them that are angry at my mother from the hardcore kids. Do they realize they wouldn't have had hardcore for 10 years without her? Uh, Mark Renser knows that from Letch Patrol and Iron Prostate. And so does George. But a lot of people, they don't know what they're talking about. This person that was IDing people and giving them a hard time was completely legally responsible. My father wasn't. And she didn't get money. And so she was giving them a hard time. And they, 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 they oh, they couldn't stand her. Hilly was the good guy. The good guy that wasn't responsible for anything. So uh, yeah. any, any uh, you understand? Anyway. We've That's talked about it. We've, 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 we've talked that you, you've mentioned that point 10 times already. So I got it. Well, um, because you brought it up again when you said my mother kicked someone out. I don't know the reason. She, usually she had a good reason. She kicked Debbie Harry out. If you want to know that, I'll tell you that one. Here's, here's, here's a good shot of uh, kind of, I, I love, I love just so everybody knows. That's Mark Yoshi from Generation Records sitting on the curb, Mr. One of our sponsors. There he is, Mark Yoshi. Um, so yeah, what? Well, so three thirteen was the art was the gallery, right? That was the gallery. Yeah, yeah. Um, any any hardcore bands that you actually liked? I I thought well, I, I liked the band that wasn't very good. I liked the lousy. I liked people what people called the lousy bands. I thought Let's Patrol were really funny. They used to dress up in wedding dresses right. i thought they were very funny and um you know uh, i don't know if you want to hear this about debbie harry and chris stein in, in the bathroom but that's a story uh, I, you know my mother kicked them out because they supposedly they were having sex in the bathroom and 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 then i saw debbie harry years later after i went to chris stein's loft and was friendly with him and, and uh well she she it was at your friend, our friend, Barry Electric. She got in out of a limousine and she got out and she looked at me. I'm not saying because me, because I guess because I'm Hilly's son. And I think she thought I was going to approach her to say hello. But but in the liner, this is another this is a part of me. Why? Why I'm upset. The Ramones on the back of the Ramones liner notes, which you, I think you could read to this day. It says the Ramones never, and since you mentioned the Ramones, the Ramones didn't play the basement of CBGB's because of Karen. She wrote, she said that nobody ever played the basement of CBGB's. That was the bathroom. She's not talking about the gallery, which was not CBGB's. It's not true. She also said my mother got the house. My, my mother, there was never a house. My sister got the house after my father passed away. We lived in a rented apartment. So she said these things about my mother. They weren't true. You know, and you I go. just want people to know that stuff. It's it just it, a lot of stuff. is just completely untrue. And she was probably pissed off because my mother kicked them out for a few hours. There's a <laughs> social distortion. I don't know if you remember them, but. Uh, that was, uh, oh yeah, that was. Uh, SFA, uh, Brandon, Brandon did, SFA. Brendan did the door in, yep. during, uh, a lot. Yes, That's right. He, he, he did the door. So let's talk about why. And I, I know it's going to I, I know it's going to be controversial. Um, yeah. 
let's talk about why CBGB closed. Why did CBGB close? Now, now, let, let, let me let me let me put out there what I understand, and then you could give us your take on it. Okay. Um, sure. Your 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 uh, CBGB landlord that was that was Muzzy Rosenblatt, right? Yes. Yes. So Muzzy, so Muzzy Rosenblatt, um, uh, from what this is just from what I understand, he kind of raised the rent and didn't really tell your dad about it, and it, it and it accrued over a couple of years, and uh, you know your your dad was never really uh, informed properly. Of these I never rent- heard that. I never heard that. I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's true. Of I think you've heard that, but mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think that's true. No. So why, think- why did CBS close? Because my father. I don't know if he ever paid anybody the money he owed them. So he the money accrued. He knew it was happening. So I don't think he didn't not, not realize it. And I think it was something like three hundred three hundred fifty thousand. And my father then had this thing about save CBGBs. At, at the time, my mother was the legal owner. He didn't tell my mother, but he said he had to go to court. So he had to became, become the owner, legally the owner, so that he can go to court, which I was told from lawyers was not true. This is all part of the story because the lawyers can go to court. My father didn't have to go to court, but he was trying to sell CBGBs. He didn't tell my mother that. My sister knew that. So, because uh, I know we had meetings next door. So what happened with, I finally called Muzzy and I said, I'd like to know what's happening. So he met me at the Starbucks on Broadway between like 3rd and 4th Street. And he said, he said, I have nothing against CBGBs. This is what he told me. He said, I wanted to meet with Hilly. He won't meet with me. And then he told me, um, uh, I don't know, it was a few weeks ago or I'm not sure exactly when it was from the time I talked to him. He said, my father said he had to go out of town and he couldn't meet with him. And he's upstairs on the second floor where the office was in of, of the Palace Hotel. And he looks outside. He sees my father being interviewed, which my father loved to get interviewed because he wanted to be, you know, you know, he, he wanted everything to be uh, about Hilly. And he was being interviewed. He did not go out of town. He didn't meet with Muzzy. So Muzzy, according to Muzzy, the save CBGBs, he didn't he didn't get it because he my father wouldn't meet with him, according to Muzzy. So I, I don't know what's true, but I think part of I, it seems like Muzzy was telling the truth. And I, and my father was trying to sell the club and didn't tell my mother about it. So, you know, it's just very disturbing because and I feel very guilty with my mother because she show, she had dementia. And she was in my apartment because where I'm living now, there was mold. And she she was in my apartment. And she all of a sudden, I wake up and I see these papers. She signed everything away with no compensation. I didn't know that's not legal. She got nothing. She signed it away. He gave me a computer. I, I was so mad. I feel bad that I blame my mother. She was just trying to do help. She got nothing. They completely ripped her off. So the whole idea of save CBGBs, look, I don't my father made up a lot of crap. He helped a lot of people. It's true. But I don't know about the save CBGBs. Did he really want to save it? If he really wanted to save it, why didn't he get these millionaire partners that wanted to be partners? Because do you he, think do you do you think that it should have been? But he kept it open, so he wasn't really for the musicians. Why didn't he just keep it open and get partners? Because he didn't. You know, know what? I I gotta say, I gotta say yeah. that. What? Times change. Things change, and yeah. I spend a lot of time. I'm down there a lot these days. Uh, not a lot, but you know, down there because we do the Bowery Electric shows and all that. And like, I almost I can't even imagine. CBGB's existing in that neighborhood now. The whole neighborhood has changed. So- it, it did change. Yeah. yeah. But it changed. doesn't mean, but I'm just telling you why it ended. Look, the guy that owned it, what's his name? The guy that, the which multimillionaire that owns the uh, 315? The, the, John Varvatos? Yeah, look, he, look, why didn't my, I don't think my father ever went to John Varvatos and said, you want to be partners? Because my father, he, his ego was, I, it has to be hilly. If it's not hilly, it has to end. So when they, they and, and somebody actually blamed my mother for it closing. Do you know, as soon as my father and sister tricked my mother, it's in the village voice. You don't have to worry about this. 
tricked my mother into, well, my sister tricked my mother into signing it away. And my father tricked, tricked them also, but my father wasn't alive when that article came out. I think as soon as my mother stopped being the owner within months, maybe a year or two, it closed. So the whole time my mother was the owner of the club, it stayed open. It's just very brief time after my father got it back, it ended. So the person that people are mad about, it kept the whole thing going with my father did too, but he didn't, he didn't try to keep it open afterwards. I don't think he really tried. I think he wanted it to close when he thought he was going to have to get partners to pay the increase of rent and, and, and the 300 so thousand dollars. I think he didn't want that. He, so I think he intentionally closed and I think Muzzy was correct. He wanted to meet with my father and my father refused. So that whole story is bullshit. But it, it, that's what I think. What um, what do you what do you think of the uh, what uh, uh, who who own, who owns the CBGB name now? I don't know. I know Tim Hayes. Uh, I think he won't talk to me on the phone anymore. Neither will my sister. Uh, maybe they're paranoid about it. He he was going to help because he agreed. My mother designed the T shirt, but he got it. She sold it to them. It's funny. My sister said, you can read this. She said she just wanted to do what's best for CBGBs. But Tim Hayes made it into this completely different bands than CBGBs. And then Tim Hayes was part of uh, supposedly Bain Capital, Erie, Erie, Erie something, Ari something, Ari's New York. And anyway, he ended up losing it to, I think, them. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, somebody I else think the bank. I think Somebody the bank, else got it. The bank owns the Aries New York was, was sort of like a bank. So maybe they got yeah, the it. The bank owns the CBGB name. But now. I think Aries was partly a bank. They were a loan, uh, some kind of yeah. multi million or billion dollar loan company. So I think they got it from Tim. I think he was in court. And look, I, I don't even know. Tim Hayes told me, I mean, he knows it's true. He wanted to show me the contract. My sister refused. So I don't even know if my sister owns part of the T-shirts, which she shouldn't own. But I, I, my sister refused to let me see the contract. Tim Hayes, who bought it. Oh, 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 before Tim Hayes, there was another company that got it. But when Tim Hayes finally got it, he wanted to show me the contract. He, he, he My sister wouldn't let me see it. So I don't know exactly what's going on because my sister is hid the contract. So gotcha. I don't know. I, I can't give you a, a definite answer. I actually don't know who's getting the money for the t-shirt. Want, want to see something interesting? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know, online, if you, yes. you know, there, there's like a CBGB virtual tour. Like if you, if you go online, it's like a virtual yeah. tour. If you go, if you go to the, the, the cover page for it, right. If, yes. if, if you go to the cover page, uh, literally, <laughs> Hold on, I could do better than that. Hold on, let me see if the fucking where is that? Hold on, let me see if this goes any better. All right, so if you go to the the, the CBGB virtual tour uh, yes. on 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 the internet, look who's fucking standing in front of the club on the phone. My father, yes. No, it's me. Oh, it looks like my father. No, on the right there. You look like on the phone. I didn't realize that's you. I thought that was my that's father. me. Short hair. Looks was, like him after chemotherapy. I don't know right how. Here. I couldn't tell you how, when, where, why, or how. So were you the real, are you the real owner? And, yes, and it's just you lying fact, to me? Yes. You're the I, real I owner the one of the that was behind. It was me. I'm, I'm, I'm the puppet master. But, uh. But there, yeah, but yeah. I, it seems Isn't that crazy? Yeah, of, of all the things you go on, and I when I when I was doing my homework, like my I go, father. wait a second. Yes, that's fucking me. <laughs> that you, crazy. You're, you look, you're much better looking than that. You know, that's a bad picture of you. Yeah, I look exactly the same as I do now. No, you know, that, that's it makes your head small. No, that's not. That, that, that's that's kind of. You know, crazy. by the way, can you say hello in case he's listening? Iggy Pop asked me for the story several times, and oh, I was afraid. Okay. So, it, oh wait, is I that an artist? It. Is that an artist that you actually like? I thought he was. Well, I thought 
I start Stiv Bader's was very talented. I oh. didn't think he was a nice guy, but right. Stiv Bader's they all imitate a little to learn from each other. Stim Bader's was imitated Iggy Pop a little. I, 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 Iggy Pop asked me for the story. I was afraid to give it to him, just like I was afraid to go see Mickey Rourke. George Christie, the hell, famous Hells Angel, sent him my script. I was afraid to go see him, and I was afraid to show him be, my uh, Iggy Pop my story because I burned it originally. And the part that Mickey Rourke was interested in, I don't know if he would have done it, uh, but was, I guess he knew that was a really good part. And so Bill Hickey, but my part, when I burned, it took me years to rewrite most my part, even though I found burnt pages because, so I felt since I was looking at it, you know, I have your, your own worst self critic, uh, or su- worst critic, sorry. Mm-hmm. I felt, well, my part wasn't good enough. I couldn't go see him. So I, I kind of blew that. So every time Iggy Pop came up to me and asked my story, I was like, that's so neat. That's so great. I wanted him to keep at- So he kept asking for the story like three times. That was my gratification. Not I didn't want to show it to him, and then maybe he wouldn't like it. That was such a thrill. Iggy Pop wants my story? Isn't how about the fact, how about Spinal, Spinal Tap played CBGB? Yeah, they were just a silly band. Yeah, they, yeah. Iggy Pop was real. I thought Iggy Pop was very talented. I thought the Ramones were talented. I just didn't personally like them. It doesn't mean I don't think people were talented. I thought the Dead Boys, I didn't like the Dead Boys, that we had a fight the first time we were there. I didn't like Stip Bader's talking about getting blowjobs from the waitresses that were my friends. I didn't think, I didn't like them. I, I didn't like them, but I thought they were talented. There's a bunch of talented bands. I just didn't personally like a lot of them. That's all. Gotcha. Roger saved me, saved my thumb. He told me to tell my father that when I had this fight with uh, Bags during Gnostic Front Show and uh, and Mark Mark Dagger, the two notorious skinheads that had been written about. I had this fight protecting Maria Mark Rinser's, uh girlfriend because crazy Mike said he wanted to fuck her. And I said, you can't come in. I was, so I had this fight and, and, and people think John from the Cormax always says, you kicked his ass. It looked like I knocked bags down. I'm going to tell you the truth. I threw bags against the way bigger than me against the CBGB. uh, Oh, the leather store. It was the leather store at the time before the the leather store, just before the canteen opened. And as I hit him, I also threw him. So maybe he went down because I threw him and hit him at the same time. But anyway, afterwards, um, John, you know, he's lying on the ground. People warn me, do not fight bags. And he's biting my thumb and my thumb is coming off. And uh, 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 crazy Mike, who started the fight and got bags to defend him because I said you couldn't come in and. Roger from Gnostic Front pried his teeth apart and my thumb came out. So I'm bleeding all over. So I'm you still bleeding. have your thumb? I st- Well, I still have my th- The cops were mad at me because after I got up, I'm walking around. And I, I and then these two giant guys, 400 pound, I, I'm not exaggerating, like six feet six, biggest guys I ever saw. I think they were roadies for a band called Anfrax or something. They uh-huh. happened to be there. They, they said, you want us to throw Mark Dagger around? Because he kicked me in the head when I'm on top of Bags saying, I'll let you up. And then Bags bit my thumb. I And then I saw Jimmy Gestapo loading his van. I can still picture this stuff. And Jimmy, I oh, yeah, I respected Jimmy Gestapo. He said, no, he's just defending his friend. I should never have listened to Jimmy Gestapo. They would have thrown him around and scared Mark Dagger to death. He deserved it. So that's and then anyway that that happened and, and Roger wanted me to tell my father. Well, I did. I told my father after he pried his. T- he said, "Tell your father what I just did because he wants more shows." So I told my father that Roger is the one. That what are you doing? Me. What are you doing fighting with hardcore skinhead kids? Huh? Because I was a boxer and, and like most boxers, I didn't fall through the boxing. I think that probably happens a lot. My I had braces. My mother interfered with. You know, Sandy took me to the. Uh, Gramercy gym when I had fights in school and I became a boxer because of gangs in school and uh, I was boxing with Sandy and and that's what and and that's why I was fight but most of my fights were at CBGB's not or in the street not in the boxing I I remember you you mentioned Sandy I I remember early days of CBGB there there were there was 
Hell's Angels at the at, at CB's a lot when I used to go. They, there. they were part of the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they were they were part of the the culture of of CBGB. And, well, also I will tell you in the movie. So I I can say this. I'm telling you the truth. So I'm okay. not afraid of saying anything. The my if you notice in the movie, you don't see the Hell's Angels. You see it. See, that's why the movie it was so bad. I'm I have well, the, the, the movie was bad for a lot of reasons, but well, yeah. one of the, no, I'm saying not because of the Hell's Angels, because they didn't. Well, for example, I called the company. I don't know if my sister heard about this. I called the company and I said, you know, I was writing this. I said this on Artie Lang, uh, and, and this is already out there. I saw I, your I, I saw your Artie Lang interview, by the way. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in a long time. It's good, but I I, I said I I called the company. I don't know if I said this on Ari Lang because my, this is a fact. I was, my mother, I didn't know how to use a computer. I had learning problems. My mother was typing my screenplay from my journal. After I burned the journal, I wrote a screenplay. She was typing it up on my sister's computer in her apartment. So when I call, when I saw she was doing the movie and I knew she taped the beginning of my story during the same, what Lenny K read, that she won't give me a copy of, which I really wish I had a copy. I wish Lenny would give me a copy. Uh, I called up California and these big time giant law firm in Hollywood and everything. They, 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 they said, well, you didn't write about the seventies, did you? And I don't think a lawyer intentionally does this because he gave it away. I said, yes. And he really panicked. Now I don't think a lawyer wants you to know that he panicked. So I think I may have influenced it. The movie was a little fake because I do know the way you can take someone's story is you change everything. Now, it would have been very hard to sue my sister anyway because what, she was there. I, I, uh, but the a, point a, is a question, a question from our from our what did you think of Alan Rickman's portrayal of your dad? Alan Rickman was very good at the nice side of my father. They mm -hmm. didn't show the side of my father that look, look, I didn't always get along with him, but uh what's his name? Tommy from Prong. I, I read a quote. It's online. I didn't, we didn't agree on a lot of things, but Tommy from Prong said, my father was more like a hell's angel. That part of my father, they didn't show. They showed this naive, nice guy. People that didn't even know my father knew a lot of it didn't ring true. Al, Al, what Rickman, uh, what's his whole name? Alan Rickman. Alan did a really good job. But, you know, I could say this, too, because I don't know if you looked this up on the Internet, but I looked it up again to make sure Rando Miller, the guy that directed it uh, right after the movie, when in a year or two went to prison. That's you can look it up. That's crazy. I, no, when you said that, I looked it up. That's crazy. I, I checked well, it out. Because, and, and you see the reason? Because he didn't get the permit for a, a, a camera girl, young camera girl. To, to be on railroad tracks and she got run over. So, ah, right. That's so, right. So since I talked to you about this, Hollywood and Steve Starr from William Morris film department wanted me to, when I showed him my story, which was just the part about, you know, just wasn't much in it that I showed him, but he said, why are you, he thought it was my father's rock club, which a lot of people did, even though it was legally my mother's. He said, why are you writing? Why, why are you, criticizing your father's rock club. His attitude was the same as those Hollywood people that completely ruined the movie. He, they made the movie into this happy movie when my father was just a good guy. They didn't show both aspects of his personality and people saw through it because it was called a biopic. Like, like for example, um, Gothic, it's completely unrealistic, but it's so well done. The acting is so good. They don't care that it's realistic because it's not a biopic. But when you see a biopic, sorry, but when you see this movie, they call it a biopic. It's not a. It's not true, people. So people don't like that when you. Well, know, what do you think about the hot chick that played your sister? I didn't like that they criticized that she said she was better looking than my sister. I didn't think that what was that's what was wrong. She acted a little like her. My sister probably really did. She probably really did help with the bookkeeping. But my mother did so much more. My mother wasn't mentioned because my sister didn't want to get sued. She didn't mention me or my mother. She didn't want to open up a can of worms. And something I told you, I would say that you cannot get in trouble for. You can't get in trouble for it because because I'm not going to say the names. But I want to tell you because I'm not going to even give the answer. I want people to want to know why. 
I think one of the main reasons the Hells Angels, well, my hey, be sister, careful. Don't don't get me in trouble with the Hells I'm Angels. I'm not naming. Please. No, listen. I'm telling you something that's a proven fact that 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 I mentioned. That, that is just a fact. I've told people. People, look. This is not unusual for a rock club. Two people connected with the club died. They died. I'm not going to say who, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. But I will say, a lawyer said, don't say this because he's afraid of me getting in trouble. You won't get in trouble. I'm saying this. My sister told me something completely different than she told a grand jury. And that, and anybody that did it, they're not alive, so nobody has to be afraid of it. They're not alive who did it. But she told me something completely different. So I think that's why some bikers aren't mentioned. I think she'd open up a can of worms. She didn't want me to. She, that's why she won't talk to me on the telephone. And when people think I'm petty for bringing this up, well, I have a reason to be pissed off because the whole idea was my mother never got any money. And I ended up having a fight with my father. And she immediately told the police that I'm a troublemaker when I was defending her against a six foot four inch intern. I got arrested, but she wouldn't tell on people when they were killed. She lied. So I I'm, I have a personal reason for saying, why did he blame me? Because they would do anything to protect the club. But when it came to her own brother, she didn't care. That was my movie. That was my dream of helping my mother. I felt so guilty. My mother helped me pay my rent. She did everything because she knew my father wasn't helping me and he was supposed to. And, she, and my mother did so much for me and all the club, everybody. And I won two film festivals. I, I, I don't have to read it to you, but I sent it to you. I won two, two first play prizes in film festivals because I wanted to help my mother and me. And then my sister takes the idea, gets my mother to sign everything away and completely ruins it and makes a flop. So I, I, I want I want to do the movie. I want to do what my mother wants me to do. And my mother stopped me from becoming a boxer because she didn't want me to get brain damage. And I had braces. So she told Al Gavin, a famous uh, fight uh, trainer and, and cut man, she told him not to let me box. That's why I didn't continue boxing. You went to, fil you went to film school, right? I, yeah, because I want, I had a dream of helping my mother. It's not easy winning two first place prizes at prizes at two different festivals. I wanted to pay my mother back for everything she did for my father and me and musicians. And I got really close. And I and eight film companies called the new school, and I was in court with my father. Got it. And, and, and so it was it was terrible. And and then and, and as I'm in the paddy wagon after I. My father was trying to drag me out because I was trying to protect my mother when we were making copies of my story. Uh, mm -hmm. Of uh, she, uh, My father was trying to drag me out. The third time he tried to drag me out, I didn't think about it. I hit him because he wouldn't let go of me. And he went through the door. I, I don't, I'm a little guy. He went through the door, and then the police came, and I'm in the paddy wagon, and my sister shows up with her husband, and they say he's a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker because I'm saying what happened. You, you ever read Island from Aldous Huxley? It, it's a great book. He it, He's a reporter. I always felt like I'm a reporter. I want people to know what happened. I was influenced by the book. I'm the opposite of trying to cover up what happened. I think I should be able to say what happened, especially since my mother was so badly treated. And, you don't understand. I want people to know the truth. <laughs> it's important to me. Uh, hey, I got I got to take a sponsor break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to take some questions from around the world. Okay, telling the truth is a troublemaker, you know. I think truth is okay. We're, we're all right. I'm, we're going to take. A, this is going to be a quick break. May I go to the men's room? room. Go, go ahead. Go to the men's room. I know how to do that. I've been doing it. For go a go go. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. It's been a while since we had a good roller coaster ride like this. Yo, Chris, you made me laugh out loud. If, if, if I wasn't a patron, this would convince me. Come on, people. Right on. Listen, absolutely right. Support the show. <laughs> Support the show on Patreon. There's a PayPal address. Do a super chat function. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Often imitated, never duplicated. Clank your chains. Count your change. And we are sponsored by blah, 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 blah. And Mad Vintage. 
Mad Vintage buys, sells, and collects band shirts, primarily hardcore. The DIY operation was started and is operated by a hardcore kid who just loves collecting and eventually got into vintage clothing, specifically the realm of vintage band shirts. They are always looking to buy out collections to either keep, sell, or trade. New shirts added daily at www.madvintage.com and posted on Instagram. Check out this kid's page. There's a lot of great shit on there. Dig deep into that closet of crap and reach out to them and make some dough for yourself. Help me help you. Last but not least, Joe Romini and the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians and all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as to style them for stage, album covers, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famous, Greg Rowley, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information on online sales is being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www. TexasSilverRush.com. That said, yo, post, listen, what do you want me to tell you? Post, post your questions. Let's get crazy. It's just that kind of a party. The last time we had a show like this is when we had Dave Dichter from MDC on and also Dave from Tree. It's just that kind of a party today. So post your questions. Let's have a couple laughs because that is the only true currency we have in this wretched life of ours is laughter. So that said, hey, once again, I want to mention I'm going to be up in Albany. Uh, I'll be up in Albany on Saturday for Biohazard. Uh, after that, I'm out west uh, with Incendiary Device. We're playing March 9th with Channel 3 in San Diego and March 10th with Channel 3 in San Pedro. Yo, ID just got added to the On the Streets Again uh, Fest 2. We're playing the second day with Doug and the Slugs and a couple others. It is at the Meadows on March 16th. Sunday, April 7th, excuse me, Sunday, April 7th, I will be moderating the From Punk to Monk book event with Ray Capo at Generation Records. A uh, week after that, I will be moderating the Ray Capo From Punk to Monk book event up at Bridge Nine Records in Beverly, Mass. Sunday, April 21st at the Bowery Electric, all ages Sunday free matinee with Fahrenheit 451, Kings Never Die, Brick by Brick, The Car Bomb Parade, and Faded Line. Get off your lazy ass. Bring that booger-eating kid. Bring them, that bitchin' wife or that bum-ass husband of yours and get down to the show one block away from CBGB's. Come feel, feel the community and feel the culture. Art Show, Saturday, September 4th, up at said Bridge Nine Records. Uh, Mike Gala from Agnostic Front, Lori Dawn, and Christopher Mitchon. Uh, of course, this is put on by our friend Larry Kelly uh, up at Bridge Nine. Get your ass up there. Sunday, May 25th, in our beloved in our beloved Tompkins Square Park. Free show in Tompkins Square Park. Rebelmatic, ID, non-residents, cartel, guitar me of one, Scott Helen. Come on out. It's, it is Tompkins Square Park. And then, of course, Rampage Fest 6 with Adrenaline OD headlining is Sunday, June 2nd. Two stages. Seven bands, AOD, Silence Equals Death, Dija, Blackout Shoppers, Fire is Murder, Iconicide, and No Compromise. Is that enough for you? What do you want me to do? Set up in your living room? You want me to smoke it for you? That said, I see there's a lot of comments. Um, let's bring Dana on. All right, you ready for this? Hello? Hello. Oh. Hey, let, let me ask you. This is a person. This is this is coming from me. Uh, ever see the Bad Brains? Yes. Any thoughts on the Bad Brains? They were nice. They said hello to me. <laughs> okay. I, I I just want to say two sentences about this. Anybody that killed anybody. They're not alive, so nobody can get in trouble for it that did anything. So I don't mm -hmm. want anybody to worry that they can get it. They're not alive anymore. I just want to make that clear. Uh, I saw the bad brains. Uh, they were nice. I, I didn't like a lot. Look, I'm just, I don't want to lie. I didn't like a lot of the music. I, I was like the anti-punk. But mm. why should I? Do people want me to lie? Maybe some people do, but I didn't like it. I, I just, I, I'm telling you, 
how I felt about things. I, I, the situation wasn't good for me because I didn't like the situation when my mother was in. She didn't know what the hell she was doing there. Sometimes she thought she was stupid. She didn't, in some ways, I guess she felt she was, I mean, she had a point. What is she doing there? You know, my, she didn't get anything from it. And I was there trying to help my mother and I, and my dream of paying my mother back never happened. So I'm, I, I, in some ways I kind of hate myself. It was my fault too. And my mother never sued my sister. I, everybody that writes that, they're not really getting it right because my mother had dementia and I was her power of attorney. So it wasn't my mother's idea when people blame my mother, like, like Arturo makes this face that when he's interviewed in the times or Danny Fields calls her a witch, Danny Fields, you know what, you know, what's funny about it. Look, Danny, Arturo's not alive. And I don't know if you know this, but you, there's a dead man's law. You can write it, say anything about somebody that's not alive. The, the family, there's nothing to do about it. A Toro complains that my mother sued. First of all, my mother didn't sue my sister. I was the power of attorney. My minute didn't know. I was trying to get money for to, to help the situation because I was trying to help my mother with dementia. And uh, a Toro, I, I, this is why I'm telling you I could say this. When the I'm not going to say which doorman because you don't want to get in trouble. But the door, one of the doormen used to call up a Toro a lot. And say, I got the money now. And he used to go to a tour's loft, come back with cocaine. And 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 so he was basically, he was ripping off the door by dealing cocaine to the doorman. So who's a Toro or Danny Fields for example, complaining about my mother suing when I'm the one that sued? It just, it just, some of this stuff pisses me off so much. The hypocrisy in it. My uh, mother Kevin Christopher. Kevin Christopher, I'm not sure what band he's in, but he says, Karen was stern, but awesome. She always called my mom before she let me in. Oh, even, if my yeah, band, even if my band was playing, Hilly would just look at me like nothing I can do, kids. Sorry. Oh, no, but that sounds like it's that really nice. Kevin Christopher, I wish you'd send me a friend request because I don't know how to spell your last name. That, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate So she's thanking my mother for calling his mom. Yeah, my mother had good intentions, and she was also, it wasn't just good intentions. My mother kept the hardcore going because she was responsible. She didn't want to get in trouble. It wasn't mm -hmm. just she was concerned to the kids. She didn't want to get in trouble. So I really appreciate that comment because the situation with my mother was terrible for me. Do you know how much harder it was being Karen's son and loving my mother than Lisa being Hilly's little girl? Imagine the guy that got all the credit. She was his daughter. It was easy. It was fun. I had a hard time defending my mother the whole time. I was miserable. I had a, it, I'm still miserable and feel bad about it. How about mm -hmm. um, Val asks, what's the best CBGB show you ever saw? I think Patti Smith was amazing. I can't believe the way she performed. I actually think Stiv Bader was a great performer, even though I didn't personally like him. He right. was a great performer. I, I thought the Ramones were, were great performers. Uh, television was great. There's a lot of bands that weren't known that were just funny, like Letch Patrol. Or, I can't think of all. I can't name all of them. They were they were fun. What's the guy that transferred? Uh, Wayne County. Wayne County yeah. was funny. The Hells Angels actually didn't get mad when he was sort of flirting with them in the audience. <laughs> I think he might have sat on their lap. They they actually thought it was funny, which which is pretty good. The Hells Angels did some good things. They, the, I think, uh, look, I'm not going to go explain it, but a couple of Hells Angels may have saved my mother's life once when these two guys came in uh, talking about chopping people's heads off and it was alone. And JB, and I think it was Odie. I, I'm not sure which one showed up. I think JB was alone and, and then Odie came in. And they say, they all they did is they, they, they could be really cool about it. They said to the, the the three guys that were going to chopping talking about chopping heads off. They said, um, "You have more trouble than you can handle." That, I remember mm. the exact quote, and they, they didn't want the trouble. But I think they. Uh, the Here's look, this is Kenny Clark asked, and I'm gonna I'm gonna field this one. Okay, uh, any good memories with the Misfits? Truth be told, the Misfits Misfits weren't really associated with CBGB. The Misfits played CBGB, I think, twice in 1977. I think their first show they ever played there was in 77. The Misfits were not a CBGB band. Well, a lot, well, look, look, you, you mentioned that. 
uh, 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 Guns N' Roses were not a CBGB band. Yeah. They wanted to be able to say that. He, I think his motivation, uh, what's the guy from Guns N' Roses I said that I would lend Axel Rose. I think he wanted to be able to say, even though it was the gallery, he wanted to have the connection to brag about the connection. I don't, so a lot of bands were not part of CBGBs, but they wanted to have the connection. Somebody wanted to do a memorial for my mother, but she wasn't one of the bands. I wanted the bands that she helped to do the memorial. So a lot of people that were from the outside wanted to be associated with the name that weren't really part of it. I, I yeah, that that happened a lot. Here, here's here's uh, Jason Jason Eldridge asks, did the New York Dolls ever play CBGBs? I don't I don't think so. I I I don't think so because we we mentioned the Mercer Arts Center. That was like the, their home and their scene. Uh, but who did play CBGBs later? Of course, was. Uh, David, um, David Johansson and Johnny Thunders and, well, and David uh, also, Johansson, uh, Johnny Thunders. Yeah. 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 So people from the band, I'm not sure if the band played. So a lot, to be honest, a lot of the stuff I didn't pay attention to. I, yeah. I would sit there, take notes, write down on napkins what happened. What, you know, I was writing my, my journal, but I didn't really, a lot of times I didn't care who was playing. I was just, mm -hmm writing stuff down about, I was sitting there not liking the music, writing about the past, Hillies on the Bowery. That's what I did a lot of the time. I sat there next to the cooler, writing down in napkins what I wish people knew about that, you know, they, they didn't know about the story behind of the, uh, the CBGBs. I wanted everybody to know that. That's what I did. And I, a lot of times I ignored the bands on stage because I didn't, I didn't like it. Here's, you, you mentioned, um, um, so I'm not the most brilliant person when it comes to music and knowing what's going on with music. Got yeah. it. Um, you mentioned Tommy Victor and uh, Tom Victor, who was later on in prong and Tommy was a sound man. Th this is a picture taken by one of my former bandmates. He's been on the show many times. Uh, you know, this is from Neil Zum Osberg who took some pictures to the last couple of, now I know this is sort of the setup at the last day, but, this is a pretty cool picture, and, and no one's ever seen this. He just sent this to me today. But this is the the the, the kind of the look at the soundboard uh, at, at CBGBs. I mean, CBGB had eventually great. It's band sounded great in there. Norman Norman Dunn did. The, Norman yeah. Dunn designed the sound. Tell, tell us Dennis about Dunn's, how did the sound thing, how did the sound Dunn's thing come together? Brother, the crazy dentist that used to make up stories. His mm -hmm. brother designed the sound system. And Charlie Martin was the, the, the first sound man, but Norman came afterwards and designed the soundboard. It was Dennis Dunn that I don't know how they design a, design a soundboard. I'm not mechanically that smart, but it was Norman Dunn that everybody gave the credit to. He did yeah. it. Yeah. Norman Dunn. Uh, and he, he, he set up the original sound system. Yeah. He, well, set it, fixed it, you know, kept it going. Yeah. I don't think you just do it once. I think you have to keep. Oh, oh, oh so he, he, he was sort of on call to come in and fix shit. He was there for years. Yeah. Here's a picture of Zum inside one of the, the last, uh, you know, you know, Vin, you know, you know, Vinny Stigma told me Vinny Stigma. Vinny Stigma was a nice guy. He told me he'd give me a free tattoo once. I never got it, but I wanted a free fake tattoo, but he was, what did Vinny tell you? I, 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 Vinny was a nice guy. Yeah, he was. I'm looking for. I'm looking for the picture. There's a picture to go with it. Uh, CBGB closed. No, that's not it. Uh, CBGB closed. No, that's not it. There's a picture of. I'm just looking for a picture of the stage after it closed. Um, I guess. Nope. Where is that? Anyway, Vinny Stigma told me that after the um, CBs closed, he brought home, he had like, I guess people took mementos and shit, and he had a little piece of the stage, like a little piece of the wooden stage, you know, maybe this big or whatever. And he said one day when he brought it home, he noticed that it was sort of like it was moving and that the, the, the wooden stage had, had mites and, and there was like bugs it was like infested really? with bugs. And he brought wow. it home to his apartment and put it on the kitchen table. And he was appalled when, when wow, bugs that's started. Interesting. Yeah. Makes sense, right? Oh, makes sense. I was just thinking. Hey, you what, know, what, what happened to the, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, but what happened with the, um, what do you call it? The, 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 uh, 
the canopy, the the the. Um, oh, someone stole it. I forgot the yeah. band. They right. they stole it. Uh, they they stole. I don't know. Someone stole it. There was about six of them. My mother did the original one, and she did the Hillies on the Bowery, and the ones after that she didn't do. And, and uh, that was one of the ones stolen. I forget the name of the band. <laughs> I think they should have got the Hell's Angels to come get them. Uh, right. They were out west. I think they should have. The Hell's they were supposedly in their backyard. I think my father probably could have gotten the Hell's Angels to come get the canopy. You know, I, I wouldn't like to tell you because people say it's one of the best. It's I think it's the best story about my mother. Awning. The awning. Story. I'm sorry. The awning. I call right. it the canopy. Uh, something that happened. I'd like to tell you when you, you give me a chance when you feel. Oh, like Jody it. Foster's army. Uh, Jody Foster's army. Yeah, that's army what they say. Stole it. Right. I'd like to tell you something that happened with my mother and the Hell's Angels and my father in Merv, the house manager. It, it just, I think it's the maybe the best. I, I think it's the best story I have about my mother. I just like to tell you the story, but if you give me, if you if you're ready for it, I'll, I don't want to get in. I don't want to talk anymore about the Hell's Angels on the show. But, but it's a really good Angels. story. It's a really, it's, it's, it's the best in, story about my mother I have. You know, we're, we're taking questions from people. We're not, we're not okay. veering off and going on about, about the Hell's okay. Angels anymore. Um, what else? Um, let's see. No, Metallica never played CBGBs. Oh, did you ever have, was there ever any comedy in CBs? Artie Lang was, uh, was, was in the improv. He, he was comical. He, he, uh, the last thing I said to Artie Lang is because I kind of knew. I said, when you become famous, will you still talk to me? So, of course I will. I didn't know he got on the Howard Stern show. So he probably could have helped me get Howard Stern for my film. But I had no idea he was on the show because I, for that re for some reason, when he was on the show, I, I had didn't have a TV for, the, TV for the five years of that. So Artie Lang was, there was a comedy in the improv. But most of it was my mother wanted it to be at a truth. So she didn't have much silly comedy but Artie Lang was really good as I don't think he was great on the radio I think he was good as a performer I think he was a fantastic performer so I, I, you, I, you know I, I mentioned kind of silly I mentioned this before um in in the book I put out recently uh Paul Bearer from Sheer Terror mentions talks about being in the the canteen and, and drinking with some friends and your mom was part of a um uh, a, a group of um, what, what do you, you just of um, what do you call it? Um, not ad libbers. What is it called? Um, you just mentioned it. She was part of an acting, uh, and and he said he saw her. She uh, directed the group. That's what she. She was. I was the producer. What's the word I'm thinking director. of? I'm I'm, I'm frazzled. Um, the CBGB Improv. The improv. She was part of an improv group, and they were practicing, and he saw them. And he complimented. He said she was very, very good. Yeah. Well, I told you my answer. You don't like my answer. Which is what? Hell's Angels? No. It's, I'd like to tell you about the short thing about the Hell's Angels. But the thing about Paul, look, Paul was friendly to me. But, you know, I don't like that he punched around Lex uh, Harris when they would do a slam dancing. Harris is not a fighter. And, and when he sent me a friend request, because he was always friendly to me, I looked at his page. He has it right on his page. I look, I don't think that's funny that Paul has, you know, the people, the famous picture of the North Vietnamese running naked in the street because they from napalm. Uh -huh. He has a picture laughing like a fa his face on the screen. I don't think that's funny. So I didn't accept it. I, I don't think that kind of stuff is funny. So uh, I, you know, I, I, or, you know, I, 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 I was friendly to Paul. I respected him somewhat, but. Uh, you know what? We have a, a request. Let's hear the Hell's Angels story with your mom, and let's oh, hear it. Because I think it's the best story. I really appreciate it. All right, it. Let's, come on. You know what? Let's Matt, you do it. Here <laughs> it is. Here it is. And the big incident. I don't know the guy's name, so I don't think he can get sued. Okay, the biggest. My, I'm in. There's a big crowded party of CBGBs. I think it was the very beginning of CBGBs. I, I don't think it was the end of Hillies on the Bowery. Big party, like over a hundred, especially with the old ladies. Maybe more. All of a sudden, we hear, bah, bah, and we look, we see a Hell's Angel that I don't know his name, because everybody knows there's fights with Hell's Angels with old ladies. Hell's Angels whacking his old lady. My mother approaches him. So I don't worry, I'm not mentioning his name, because I don't know his name. My mother gets in the middle of it. She says, you don't put your hands 
on, 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 a, on a woman in my club. And then all of a sudden, like 150 people, complete silence, complete silence. And my mother's like standing a little away from the, be uh, the beginning of the bar. I mean, you know, towards the front. And Ginzo walks over to her. I don't think Ginzo, Ginzo knows it happened. It, it's not terrible. He puts his arm on her shoulder. He says, that's his old ladies. My mother, and then he says again, that's his old lady. And my mother says, I can't hear you with your hand on my arm, on my shoulder. And then she takes his arm off her shoulder. Everybody's silent. And then Sandy, the president, who I box with as my friend, takes my mother outside with my father. And the first thing Sandy says is, respect your husband. They weren't married anymore. That's another reason why my father could get away with cheating her. And then my this is when I, I never liked my father again after this. Well, I didn't like him very much. This is exactly what he said. He said, you emasculated me. So I'm thinking all my father could think of, my mother said she's the owner to save the girl, to stop the fight. And all my father could think of is you emasculated me. And then in the story, I don't remember if I have this correct. I, it was either the next day or when it happened, and my mother comes inside and Merv, the big gentle house manager, she goes, and Merv is very happy about what happened. And that's the end of the story. But people think, hey, that show, that's a very good example of what my mother was like. And it's a very good example of how my, fa my, my father was like, Look, you know, that's all he cared about. My mother saved the girl. She wasn't trying to brag she was the owner. She was trying to save the girl from being smacked around. That happened. Anyway, okay. I just thought that's okay. a great story. Okay, that, that was my mother. Any okay, as we had. My down mother had a lot of guts. She was afraid of my father, but no, probably nobody. Hey, else. we used to we used to fear your mother when we when, when we used to when we used to play. Like we we you, you know why? Because because if you smoked pot in CBs, your mom would throw you. If you get thrown out, you, you, there was no, well, it was there illegal. Was no pot smoking. There was no pot smoking in CBGBs. Yeah, yeah. Today, she, yeah, it would be different. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was, she was legally responsible. I had a very hard time being Karen's son. It was like I said, it was easy being Kill Hilly's daughter. I, 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 I used to say, George used to say, because I used to kid. I, I told the New York Times once. I used to tell people, I'm the son of the king of punk rock. I thought it was funny, and George used to repeat it from the George Tap. My father didn't get it. He thought, "Oh, oh, you're using my name." I just thought it was funny. I, I you know, I, I, and and one time the Times is interviewing my father, and 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 my and my father's telling them, and they're saying how you know brilliant he is or whatever about, oh, yo, know, this original music. And I said, "Mom, why don't you tell him the truth? Why don't you tell the?" My mother said, "He needs it." Like, like she didn't need to to get the to, and you know that it, that it was because of ASCAP. Then he leaves, and I follow him outside. I meet him on the corner of Second Street and and and, and Third Avenue. I say, you know, I, I, I'm Dana Crystal. He says, you're Hilly's son. I said, yeah. I said, I'd like to tell you what really happened. And he he takes my phone number. And I forgot his name, and he never called me. And I always thought, so the paper of record. They don't want to know. They only interviewed my father from the family. That's the paper of record, New York Times. They don't want question, to know. Question from. You know, they don't want to know the whole story. <laughs> no, they just want their story. Gary CC. What's up, Gary? I hope you're well, buddy. I wonder why the toilet was moved from the left to the right constantly. <laughs> I don't think it was moved constantly, but I, it might have been moved a few times. I don't think it was constantly. I think it, it might have been removed because of plumbing. I I don't remember that. I, honestly, I don't remember that happening. So I don't think it it wasn't constant, but it, 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 he's probably right. It probably happened. I, I don't have the answer. Was it, there was a girl. There was a woman's bathroom at CBGB, right? A woman's bathroom. They actually they respected women. They gave them the door. The right. men didn't have the door. Yeah, I mean, and so men would go into the women's bathroom to do the drugs. With the women, they, you know, it was because of drugs. They didn't want, you know, yeah. that, that's the reason. Makes, uh, makes, makes sense. It's not that, you know, unless you're in prison, I guess you really don't want to sit on a toilet in front of everybody. I mean, well, or the army, my dad says, my dad says in the army, there'd be 30 guys sitting on toilet, sitting in, in the, on the toilet in front, facing each other. The army just breaks you down, you know? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's uh, RS70 asks, do you want to make a documentary or a movie? I want to direct the movie. I won, uh, you saw what I won, the Central Park University Best Fictional Cinema and the New School Best of Show. I have more qualifications than, than Randall Miller as far as independent films go. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't go to prison yet. So I, I think they should let, I think somebody smart that isn't going to listen to Hollywood should let me direct the film. You know, I told you earlier about what William right. Goldman said. Uh, uh, how, uh, William Goldman says in his book, Adventures of the Sh- Screen Trade, that nobody knows anything about, he doesn't think anybody really know has the answer. So when people listen to agents, all these people, there's no expert. People don't know what's going to be a success. They were wrong. They're wrong all the time. And I think they should have me direct the film. I, I would. I, I want to do it for because I uh, because I want to do what my mother wanted me to do, and and I want to do it for myself. And I think I'd make a great film. So uh, yeah. that's what I want to do. I want. I want to. I want my book to get published too. And, and I want to say one last thing very quickly. I'll say, you know, it's very complicated talking to editors and agent. I had one editor that she made uh, almost thirty appointments to meet with me. So I kept contacting her like being a pain in the ass, but I didn't, but she never told me she didn't want to meet with me. It's very confusing. And then another person told me an agent, an actor's agent. She said, send me anything you want, no matter how outrageous it it is. I didn't know. I don't know how to do it. What do you call when you send, you send it all at once. You put it into a something on a A treatment. What? No. I mean, when you put it on the computer as a, a word, a word file. You put a file. I didn't know how to do a file. Uh-huh. So I so she said, send me anything you want. So I sent her like 20, 10 pages things instead of one time. So she probably thought, but I only did what she said I could do because I didn't know how to do the word file. So she got mad at me. So a lot of things, people say these things, but she didn't mean send anything you want, no matter how outrageous. And, and the other person that wanted said she'd meet with me and that broke 30 appointments, she didn't mean it either. So it's hard to know what people mean. I'm sure this has happened with you and everybody. Uh-huh. There's yeah. a lot of misunderstandings. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, I feel bad, but sometimes about them, but you don't really know sometimes what people really mean by what they, they say or what they want. So, okay. Uh, in parting, dare I ask, how would you like the legacy of CBGB? To, to be remembered in your words, in Dana Crystal's words, what, you know, what would you like to, how do you, how would you like to see the, the see at the 50th anniversary of CBGB? What is the CBGB legacy to you? And how would you like it to be remembered? Well, I respect the musicians and the, and the, and the, and the people that came to see the show to like the music a lot more than I did. They don't have to like what I like. But I would like them to want to know what happened before CBGB's and how it began at Hilly's on the Bowery and my mother. But uh, I wish they knew the whole story and I wish I got to do what I wanted. But I understand how I I wish the famous musicians from CBGB's didn't care that I have some things that they might want to hear about my my father because my father helped them. I wish they wanted to know the whole story. And the, most of the famous musicians don't. But the people that are watching, they, they want to hear the whole story, mostly from what I hear. But the musicians don't. They just know they got it because of my father. They don't care that my mother was used. And I, I, I would like to tell the whole, my perspective. Even though I respect that they're excited by the club, they love the club, they don't have to think like me. It, you know, you know, like you said, with your family, or I'm not going to go into it, or anybody's family, Having a divided family, I'm not sure about your family, but a lot, of, it's very common. What happened with me and my father and my sister happens all over the world. The only difference between what happened with me and happened with CBGBs is it's a world famous rock club. That's it. Yeah. The other stuff is very similar. Divided families happens all the time. So I wish I could tell my story because that's what my mother would want me to do. She stopped me from getting brain damage from following through with the boxing. And I think instead of killing myself, I think I should I should follow through and do this. And that's what I wish I could do. I, and I really appreciate you letting me tell that Hell's Angel thing. Uh, 
I, I appreciate that because I was mad. It was at you great. It was great. So, it was great. And I wish I could get advice for you about filmmaking after we talk uh, another time because you you made. We'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk about it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Oh, I want them to know I, I got my nose fixed because I got it broken so many times. I think they did a terrible job. I look better with it broken. I like that thing you have me picture on. I'd look better with the broken nose on the on the on the uh, poster than the, I, they ruined my nose. So I'm, I was afraid to do this, but I did it. Anyway. Chris Hoffman says, thank you, Dana, for sharing your stories. I thank I really appreciate you. Let me do this. And and I want it. And somebody else asked me to do a podcast. After I talked to you, and I'm glad I didn't do it because I thought I should start with you. I, I thought, and, and, and our, our, our great, our That's... great, our great friend and supporter, RS70 says, "Everyone's family's different. You're appreciated, Dana. Much respect." I really appreciate it, and, and, and I hope we talk again because I would like to talk to you about filmmaking and stuff. Anytime, Dana. I'm, I'm, I'm and very, I... I'm very accessible. That's how I got to where I am. Oh, I'm a very and, and by person. the way, Alice, I apologize, Alice. I, I, I she, she gave me a letter for Jerry Ramon. I'm really sorry that I made fun of you. And, and I'm and Leona, even though it's your fault too, I apologize. A couple of people I pissed off when I was younger, and, and I, I'm sorry. And 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 Ernie, I really without Ernie, I don't know uh, Ernie and Mar Marek Bukowski from. Uh, What's the band? I can't say the name of the band. It's in a famous band. Oh, he's going to be mad, maybe. I, they helped Give me us so a clue. much. Give us a clue. It was one of the CBGB bands. Uh, uh, an early it's, punk it's, band? It's one of the punk bands from CBGBs, not hardcore, from the late 70s. And I, the I Fast? The Fast? No, it's. I think it starts with a C. He he I, I, he helped me more than anybody. Kenny, you know, my friend Clay Clark says the nose looks great. Thanks for everything. We love you, Dana. Yeah, most <laughs> people don't care. I, I just, I, but I, anyway, I really appreciate it. Token entry. I, I, I want to thank. Token I want to thank all the people. You talking about token? The band Token Entry. No, no? I, I, I'm going to think of it as soon as I hang up. Yeah, all right. Uh, but what can I say? If you look at Mark Kowski, you'll see the band. Anyway, he's been my friend for years, and and and. And so is Ernie. And I want to say thank him. And I want to say hello to Demita. She's pretty famous, too, for when she used to hang out at CBGB's. Hi, Demita. You know what I want to say, uh, honestly? Uh, and I want to thank the the, 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 the the Amsterdam Pool Hall. I go there and I drink coffee and I, I write there because it's a lot of white noise. And I, they treat me so nice. I'm so The Amsterdam lucky. Pool Hall? It's the it's called the Amsterdam Billiards, it's on, on, but it's on, on, on Eleventh Street. It's on Eleventh yeah. Street between Third and Fourth Avenue. They're, they right. they treat me way better than anybody in CBGBs because they because they because I'm not family, so they, they right you know it was a conflict when I was there. So they treat me wonderfully. I, I have so many friends there. I'm so lucky about that place. What I were you going to say? Sorry, I'm I sorry. want to say. Hold on. On behalf, I just want to get a nice graphic up. You know, uh, you know, upon closing, just, you know, on behalf of, you know, on a personal note, you know, I played CBGBs many times uh, when I was in the high and the mighty. And then when I was in antidote and, you know, I sure as heck, I, I, I spent many, 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 many weekends uh, at, at the, at the matinee shows you know, for yeah. years. And like yes. you said, the matinee shows that your mom was a big part of, you know, making happen. And uh, speaking for myself, I just want to thank you and, 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 and thank, you know, I know your mom's not around anymore and your dad's not around anymore, but just thank your family, everything, everything your family did. I know it's tough, like you said, families, you know, uh, not all families, uh, you know, are kumbaya and get along and whatever, whatever. But, you know, what you did and your mom did and what your dad did, you know, you gave a platform to so many, many, many bands, many musicians, many people, and gave them a jumping off point uh, to have careers and do so much. And it, it just, this world would be a very different place if it was not for CBGB. Well, it and wasn't me though. It was my mother and father. It but, was but I am part you. of it. It I was all of you. You are yeah. part of that legacy. You are part of that legacy. You are, your sister is, your dad, your mom, the whole thing. You know, it, it, it's your whole Thanks. family. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for that. 
And, uh, and if anybody world, wants to this know, this world would be a very different place if it was not for CBG. And, I, and, and I'm not going to mention names, but if people want to know what happened with their mother in the hospital and the fentanyl, what they did to her, I'm going to mention names on my Facebook page and on email. I, I, I won't mention it with you because I respect you and you don't want to get sued. Let them try to sue me. I know what they did. I, okay. So I'm, that's going to be mentioned. I'm going to mention that. Because I'm okay. really pissed off how it ended for my mother. So I want to say that too. But okay. I won't mention it because you didn't, didn't want me to mention certain names. I won't. Thank you. Dana, let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon, okay? Thanks for everything. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. Well, there you have it. New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Great show today. Great show. Um, that's right, Paul Stone. I am proud beyond words to have played that stage. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, yes, you can finally, you can finally get out of your car. Whew, man, what a workout. God, what a workout. Um, listen, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? They all, it all can't be just me and my knucklehead hardcore friends talking about the A7, right? You know, this was, uh, you know. That's right. We got to get the sister on next. There, there you go. Quite a doozy. Absolutely. Very. Listen, a lot of people were watching. I hope you enjoyed it. You know? Oh, Lisa, you, what did you walk into? <laughs> you missed it. Hey, Robert, we'll see you in May. You are coming to New York with your family. We will see you at the Black and Blue Bowl. I might be doing a walking tour then as well. You know, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Chris Hoffman. Yeah, it was great. You know? Hey, Kenny Clark, are we going to see you when we play out West? Um, yeah. Hey, you know, you know, it's a picture I didn't. Zum gave me another picture that was very cool that has never been seen. Check, check this one out. Um, this one's never been seen. This is the Bab Rain set list when they played those closing, uh, I think the closing of CBGBs or whatever it was, Bab Rain's. That's, that's uh, Bab Rain's set list. Pretty cool. Check that out. Eye Against Eye, The Regulator, Sailing On, Right Brigade, Attitude, Ja Love, Coptic Times, Sacred Love, Let Me Help, Soul Craft, I and I Survive, Band in DC, FBK, Secret 77, Destroy Babylon, I Love Ja, Leaving Babylon, At the Movies, Reignition, Pay to Come. Never before seen photo. Yep. Misspelled Pay to Come. Is that right? Yeah, there you go. Listen. Great show. Uh, we'll see you. If I don't see you up in Albany with Biohazard on Saturday, I will see you back here on Sunday uh, for Drew Thomas. Okay, good, Kenny. We'll see you. We'll see you in San Diego on uh, March 9th. We are excited. Incendiary Devices coming out west. We're playing our first shows out west. So, so there you go. Um, that said, hey, you know, how, how do you top that, right? Fantastic day. Fantastic show. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'm a lucky dude. I'm a lucky guy. I have a great life. And, and thanks so much for, for letting me have that great life. Um, that's right. Respect to Dana for making me stronger. That's right. Absolutely. He was a great, I'm going to lie down after this. That and a lot more. Dana was a great guest and, and, he, and he's a great New York personality and, and uh, an important guest to have on the show. Like I said, listen, if it was easy, everybody would, do it, would be doing it. It's important to have different people on the show and mix it up a little bit. That's what we have to do. So until then, my friends, you know what to do. Do good things. And good things will come to you. Yeah.